Today's episode of Darkness Radio is brought to you by Babbel. Right now, get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash darkness. That's babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash darkness for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. I'm just a boy with a microphone sitting here asking you to stay tuned for the rest of Supernatural News. I'm a fragile boy at heart, and if you don't stay in there for the rest of the show, I I might break down and cry. I'm kidding! It's a Wednesday of Supernatural News! Boy, are we going to have fun today. I, I'll tell you what, I, I love you guys, but I think you're trying to make me have another heart attack. You've sent me so many stories about AI this week that I just might piddle in me little pants... You know what? It's time for us to bring in a a, a, a co-host, the co-host with the most. It's the the BCB, the big cuddly bear. We call him Beer City Bruiser. Bruiser, how you doing? <laughs> We're wiping our pants today. Huh? Yeah, you know what? Let's uh, let's preview for the kids, shall we? Uh, like I said, so many AI stories, so many AI stories. Um, and then uh, it's the theme music they love. That's is it? Don't want to scare us? Come on. No, it, is it the AI? Is it the AI music? They just want to hear the theme, huh? I got a big, big sports nigger fan. It's uh, is it this one right here? Is it? It's no, it's not that one. It's not. It's not. It's a small world. Let me get that one out of the way. Uh, I had to. Terrifying. I had to. Yeah, I had to play that the other day. It's not that. Uh, hold on. I'll get it yet. Yeah. It's the season. Oh, there it is. Oh, it's this thing right here. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we'll play that a lot later. Um, it wants to play on its own. Evidently, my board has taken over. Um, Your board's like AI? Yes. We yes. Over the world. Yes. This board right here. That's right. We, we uh, yeah, we, we love it too. Um, yeah, so, so many AI, so many AI. I promised you yesterday, I found... A story that will make Bruiser scream. We'll we'll have it very last at the very end of the program. Uh, a story that will make Bruiser scream. You just want to get me fired up. I want to get you fired up. <laughs> I want a Bruiser rant by the end of the program, and I, by God, I've I have I have found a story that I believe will start a rant. It's gonna make Bruiser's life hell. I'm just telling you. As, like, as long as like you and I are talking off the air, it's not Don Mikowski. This is Bruiser's just been throwing him at me. Always long getting me fired up. So hopefully he's not a cyborg and you have it reported that he's a cyborg and now wandering around you can buy him at Walmart. <laughs> well, if Don Mikowski was a cyborg, he would have, uh, I, I mean, he would have been more durable as a, as a Green Bay Packer quarterback. You know what? You're, uh, I think your sound just dropped out on me. Hold on a second. So if Don Mikowski was a, uh, was a, uh, a, a cyborg, a cyborg he, he would be more durable. I, I, you would have never heard of Brett Favre. I disagree. Don Mikowski would have figured a way to screw it up. He was terrible. You think so? We oh, loved God. him. We terrible. loved him in Minnesota. We, we thought he was great. Because he was your best quarterback, even though he played for the Packers. <laughs> it's true. We loved him. <laughs> he threw us so many touchdowns. It was, it was great. Why did you leave, Magic Man? Why did you leave? <laughs> Um, anyway, anywho, anywho, uh, but yeah, lots of good stuff today. Uh, lots of AI. You know what? Scientists have made a breakthrough on life's origin and it could change everything. I'll tell you what it has to do with. It has to do with a lot of biological world. world. That's life's origin, kids. Oh. Why do I have to teach this stuff to you? They should be doing that in public school. <laughs> just kidding. I just wanted to fire somebody up out there. Um, Let's see. Uh, what else? Uh, there's lots of archaeological stuff going on. They're finding remains in China. Yeah. They're finding remains in 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 Egypt, and they found remains of something that'll make Wisconsin kids proud. Um, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, just lots of AI stuff. By the way, we got uh, some Parashare stuff in today, so we're going to talk Parashare as well today. So uh, thank you for your letters. By the way, you can keep sending us emails. 
uh, timdarknessradio.com. Also, if you go to darknessradioshow.com, we got a little floaty button on the right hand side. It's blue. You just hit that button and um, and then send us a voice note. You do it two minutes at a time because <laughs> we just like to frustrate you that way. Um, but uh, send us a voice note. We'll cut it up. We'll put it on right here uh, on the air. And you can yeah. hear, hear your voice on the air with us. Ooh. See? And we'll hear them, too. And then we can give our feedback if they want it. Yeah, absolutely. That's how it works. Or if they just want us to be our jovial selves, we can do that, too. Yeah. We'll do whatever they want. They're the listeners. That's right. We'll sing. We'll dance. We'll we'll cut a, a fart in our I pants. I don't know how that. I want to see us dance, I, Tim. I, no, I, I don't know. <laughs> you and the shark go foot, me with the bad hip. We're, yeah. we're just not dancing too well. Maybe in a circle. <laughs> <laughs> well, that and there's only one foot that kicks. So, you exactly. know. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And it doesn't go very high. And, uh, and I don't think either one of us is picking us up dirty dancing style. <laughs> <laughs> it will be entertaining to see. It would. Uh, it would. Yeah. Hmm. Well, <laughs> we could sell tickets for that, I think. We could. Yeah. It's, it's, will you be my Jennifer Grey? <laughs> I will. It, it won't be a very long show, but an entertaining one. Yeah. You'll, you'll get about uh, three minutes of entertainment out of it before somebody falls and we have to call an ambulance. Well, then they'll still be entertained because they'll be laughing so hard that we we, we destroyed our bodies. <laughs> until until there's concern. You know, it's yes. always funny until there's concern, and then and then all bets are off. Uh, anywho, uh, we should probably get to it, shall we? we got a busy show here. we got lots of stuff. Lots and lots and lots of. Oh, I'm sorry. I fell asleep there for a minute. Okay, lots and <laughs> lots and lots of. Here we go. Uh, scientists, Bruiser, have made a breakthrough on life's origins, and it could change everything. Uh, it turns out we were all uh, made by two screwing dolphins. Oh, dolphins, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, it, it has to involve water. Evidently, <laughs> water is the magic elixir to making life. Well, I believe that water is amazing. Like, anytime you're feeling ill or anything, drink water. You're injured, drink water. Just drink water. Here's my problem with it. Uh, pardon my language here, kids. Uh, plug your ears, earmuffs, fish fuck in it. <laughs> that's my problem with it why do you think the oceans are salty mm. oh you know what I, I, <laughs> yeah now now you've really hit it on the head um There's some big giant blue whales in that ocean and they uh yeah they when it's a mass ejection it's a mass ejection yeah um here's my problem with it and that's this um mm, mm. you know i'm on this new diuretic right Oh yeah, which yeah. by the way helps you helps you lose weight, Bruiser. I am I am looking as slim and trim as ever. Now well, you're down some weight from the hospital visit, huh? Oh yeah, seventeen pounds, my friend. Congratulations. Well, good for I, you. I've you look not, you looking good. I've not done a thing <laughs> except for pop two of these pills a day, and I'm finding out, boy, I got to keep up with the 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 liquid intake, right? Yeah. The only problem is 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 just drinking, you know, like Gatorade or just drinking. Uh, soda or just drinking by the way you're not supposed to be drinking coffee i found out when you're on a heart diet bad choice no, well, coffee's a diuretic <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that'll dry you out even more um so you know just drinking these things is not enough um because your your eyelids start to flake off which by the way i just wiped my eyelid and a bunch of skin came off i know that's kind of morbid um Tear ducts are drying up. Right. So you got to, I mean, you got to hydrate. You got to hydrate, right? Oh, yeah. You got to hydrate, son. The only way to hydrate is is to drink water, which is, well, what, of course. which is what fish do it in. That kind of freaks me out. <laughs> um, that fish do it in water? Yeah, it does. Like they stick to swimming pools. They, well, they. Or stick to bottled water. That's what I've been doing, but it's still, it's the thought. <laughs> you know, it's like, do you want them to put a thing on the bottle saying, no worries, fish didn't fuck here or what? <laughs> yes. Yes. A disclaimer, right? We totally filtered this dude. And yeah. then like a picture of how they filter it <laughs> so that I totally get the anxiety out of my head. Really? So that, that's, yep. your, that, that's bugs you, huh? <laughs> it does. Yeah. I, I have a, I, I have drink a problem. so much water. It doesn't, it doesn't even get in my head. The only time I've ever worried about it is when I was in the ocean and I forgot it was salt water. And people say water has no taste. It's not true. If you have sensitive taste buds, each yeah. brand of water has a taste. Yeah. And well, water is way different than uh city water. Yep. Like there's, yeah, you definitely. 
And I won't. Like do- I, I'm a big fan of like the Smart Water, but so there's Smart Water and Life Water. Life Water is Walgreens version, and they yep. they do taste different. Yeah. And I I won't drink. I have to drink bottled water now. I can't I can't drink tap water anymore. Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. We always have bottled water here. Yeah. yeah. I have a bottle of water for when I make coffee in the morning and bottles of water for when we, you know, when I do the gym and go to bed at night and all that. And believe it or not, I can't drink like the, sorry, I can't, I, I can't, I don't know that I should pick on one brand over another. Put it this <laughs> way, I can't drink the soda company's bottled water because I know they just took it out of the bathtub. <laughs> you can tell. You can tell what's tap water yeah. that's been filtered, and you can tell what's like spring water. Spring water goes down clean, smooth, slides right down the gullet. Oh, yeah. The other stuff is like gritty, rough, and it kind of it doesn't slide down very easy. It like The other sticks. stuff, I think, is what you should use if you're going to cook yes. or if you're going to make a different type of drink. Yeah. That's your mixing water. Exactly. If you, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, whenever I'm in a locker room and it's got the other guys, the ones that we're talking about, I, the first thing I do is I'll either dump it on my body and go get myself a different water bottle. Yeah, yep. Or I'll pour it in my little spray bottle to spray. Or yep. Because it's like this isn't gonna this is gonna taste horrible. Not do anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's there's no, nothing in it. Yeah. 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 I'm glad we're on the same page with this. <laughs> yeah. So now I now more than ever because I've never been a big water drinker. Okay. And I think it's because, you know, my generation was go drink from the hose. Well, that was my generation, too. Yeah. And and Japan's got wonderful water. I love the water in Japan. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. See, I've, Pure. I've, always, the best way to describe it. I've always wanted to go to Japan. Oh, it's amazing. I recommend yeah. anybody out there wants to go do it. It's one of my favorite countries. Yeah? Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've always wanted to go. I never have. I, yeah. I, uh... I may just someday take a week and just go. It, it should. And when you're in like, like I was in Tokyo and I was walking around and Kevin Kelly pointed out, he goes, you notice there's no trash on the streets and everywhere you look, no trash, really? but yet there's no garbage cans anywhere either. Really? Yeah. So like I'd finish my water and I'd have my, the bottle of water in my hand and I'd hold on to it. I'd put it in my pocket or whatever until I got back to my room to throw it away. It's it, well. There's just that much respect, I guess, for, for oh yeah everything and everything. Over, the beer over there goes yeah. down easier. Okay. That was ten beers in before I had the the uh, a buzz. Really? Yeah. Huh? Because the the beers, the, their taps are so clean, and everything about Japan is just amazing. I loved it. That's Can't amazing. wait to go back. That yeah yeah. I, I that's one country I'd love to go to. I, I just oh, it's so so fun. It's top of the list. And there's so much history out there. There's paranormal history there because they look at the paranormal different than we do, mm-hmm. you know, and there's, there's just so much. It's just, it's worth it. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. Do I'm, it. I got to, I've got to. Uh, so scientists have made this breakthrough on life's origin. They say it could change everything. A new study shows that ingredients for life can form from non-living chemicals on any given beach. And it could help develop new drugs and search for alien life. Now, let me get into this and I'll tell you how. Uh, scientists have achieved a major breakthrough through or toward unraveling the mystery of how life first arose on Earth and whether it might exist elsewhere in the universe, according to a new study. Uh, a longstanding mystery, perhaps the mystery, existentially speaking, is how life originated from non living or abiotic chemicals. And for the first time ever, researchers at Purdue University have shown that peptides, which are a string of amino acids that are crucial building blocks of life, can spontaneously form in droplets of water during rapid reactions that occur when water meets the atmosphere. For example, when a wave hits a rock and throws up a misty spray, this could occur in conditions similar to those that existed on Earth some 4 billion years ago. Uh, when life first took hold on our planet. The discovery provides a plausible route for the formation of the first biopolymers, uh, which are complex structures produced by living organisms. That, according to a study published on Monday in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, again, 5 a.m. on my doorstep every Monday. I'm just saying, they just throw it right there on the doorstep, Bruce. Uh, The team says the discovery could even speed up the development of novel drugs and medical treatments by providing a new medium for fostering rapid chemical reactions. 
Uh, there are a very large number of studies showing peptide formations, uh, but they all use catalysts or modified amino acids to make species unlikely to exist naturally, said R. Graham Cooks, who serves as the Henry B. Haas Distinguished Professor of Analytical Chemistry at Purdue and senior author of the study. Uh, Cooks and his colleagues have now shown that peptides readily form in the kinds of chemical systems that existed on ancient Earth, such as sea spray from our planet's primordial oceans or freshwater dribbling down slopes. Well, that just sounds messy. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Uh, the that, most... That's what people say when I get out of the shower. Yeah. They, they're like, <laughs> look at you, just oozing of life. <laughs> it's just the fresh water dripping over the slopes. That's right. <laughs> Now you're making it sound like a like a like a commercial for the Swiss Alps. Um, the uh, most interesting implication is that similar chemistry explains other essential biological polymers, not just peptides. He noted, adding that his team plans to publish more on this topic soon. In other words, the new study has opened a rare window into the murky early years on our planet when non-living compounds somehow assembled themselves into living organisms, a still unexplained transformation known as abiogenesis. The formation of peptides is an important step in abiogenesis because these structures form the basis of biomolecules such as proteins, which can perform the, the self-replicating mechanisms that are necessary for life. Uh, the team was able to reconstruct the possible formation of these peptides by running droplet fusion experiments that simulate how water droplets collide in the air, which Cooks uh, describes as like two kids with garden hoses spraying each other. <laughs> I want you to imagine here for a second, folks, you're getting paid millions of dollars to re-simulate life on Earth and how it formed, and you've got two geeky scientists with super soakers <laughs> And goggles standing at each other going, all right, I've got my peptides uh, formed in my super soaker. And uh, <laughs> are you ready, Mortimer? <laughs> ready, fire. All right, here we go. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> Just, I picture them having like a fun little thing, like where they have the hoses, like it's a car wash for scientists. And there's, oh, look at that, creating life. <laughs> <laughs> creating life <laughs> creating life uh yeah yeah but th th so essentially they they've they're smashing smashing atoms through smashing droplets exactly yeah so and that, adding the peptide and adding some amino acids yep throwing a little amino acids in it uh so essentially they're just um they're frustrated bodybuilders is what they are. Just, <laughs> I was going to say, I had some amino acids earlier. Yeah, the gym. <laughs> they're, they're throwing some uh, protein powder and some water and they're throwing it at each other. Yeah. That's what a grant will so do. Do I have to worry now that if I put my amino acids in water that I'm going to create something? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. You're going to create a whole new twin. That's what you're going to do. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 24 pack of water. I got a whole bunch of uh, amino acids. Let's do this. <laughs> See how that works. Uh, yeah. An army of bruisers. <laughs> there you go, an army of bruisers. You won't even have to wrestle anymore, my friend. You'll just take your 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 doppelganger, you'll put him in the ring, you'll make the money. You think that's how doppelgangers came about? Maybe. Eh? Hey, look, we're onto something. See? Amino acids in water. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, let's move on. An alien hunting as uh, astronomer, look at me with my pronunciations, uh, says there may be a second interstellar object on Earth. This in a new study. Amino there acids. May, yeah, <laughs> that's the interstellar object? <laughs> yeah, it's amino acids. Uh, the U.S. military confirmed an interstellar meteor identified by Harvard astronomer Avi Leb and student Amir Siraj. And now the pair say they found another. Just magical. Just ta-da. It's just... in the ocean, isn't it? Isn't that what he's doing right now? Isn't Avi out there in the, the ocean? I think he is. Uh, like that was his big plan. I know that uh, last month, I think we had a story where he was talking about going to look in the ocean for, the, for, for this. Yeah. So maybe he found it. He might have. A pair of researchers who previously identified what may be no, the first known interstellar meteor 
to impact the Earth have now presented evidence of a second object that could have originated beyond the solar system before it burned up in our planet's skies and potentially fell to the surface, according to a new study. Amir Siraj, a student in astrophysics at Harvard University, and astronomer Avi Leb, uh, who serves as Harvard's Frank B. Baird Jr. Professor of Science, suggests that a fast-moving meteor that burst into a fireball hundreds of miles off the coast of Portugal on March 9th, 2017, is an additional interstellar object candidate that they call Interstellar Meteor 2, or IM2, in a study posted to the print, preprint server R10IV this week. I don't know how you pronounce that name, to be honest with you. Uh, the <laughs> paper has not been uh, peer-reviewed, just in case you were wondering at home. Uh, <laughs> in addition to their potential... Uh, origin beyond the solar system these objects appear to be extraordinarily robust as they rank as the first and third oh. highest me- yeah i know right <laughs> yeah i like a good robust meteor in my face yeah, every once in a while see this robust meteor yeah uh as they rank as the first and third highest meteors in material strength in a nasa catalog oh by the way i didn't know you could order meteors through the nasa catalog <laughs> I didn't know either yeah how do I get the NASA catalog? Is well, it kind of like you the way of the Sears catalog where you just get put on a mailing list? Yeah, exactly. You can't do it online. Yeah, it's, oh, it's okay. the old-fashioned catalog. So you just write to NASA, and uh, they'll send it out quarterly. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I used to get excited around the Christmas time when that Sears catalog came. You know, my grandpa used to wipe his ass in the outhouse with a NASA catalog. <laughs> <laughs> if I could tell you how long I've been waiting to crack that joke out. <laughs> since nasa put out a catalog <laughs> yes since nasa put out a catalog uh anywho uh these objects appear to be extraordinarily robust as i was saying as they rank as the first and third highest meteor in material strength in a nasa catalog that has collected data about hundreds of fireballs uh fireballs why well, i know a cream that'll put that out um <laughs> we don't have a large enough sample to say how much stronger interstellar objects are than solar system objects, but we can say that they are stronger, Siraj said in an email. The odds of randomly drawing two objects in the top three out of 273 is 1 in 10,000, and we look at the specific numbers relative to the distribution of objects, we find uh, that the Gaussian odds are more like 1 in a million. That makes IM2 an outlier in material strength, Leb added in a follow-up call with Siraj. To us, it means that the source is different from planetary systems like the solar system. Uh, Leb has attracted widespread attention in recent years over his speculation that the first interstellar object ever identified, known as Umumua, <laughs> Uh, was an artifact of alien technology. He spotted that, of course, in 2017. Umama sped through the solar system and was up to a quarter mile in scale, making it much larger than the interstellar meteor candidates identified by Siraj and Leb, uh, which are a few feet across. Leb's claims of an artificial origin for Umama have provoked substantial pushback from many scientists who do not consider a technological explanation to be likely. So there you go. Do you think they named this other one real difficult because they're sick of people going, oh, oh. I think so, yeah, yeah. They, <laughs> they're like, okay, easy now. We're tired of the, oh, my, my, reference. Uh, you know. There's these two jerks on a podcast that's yelling, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh my, my. Yeah, they, they, they didn't like that reference. In fact, I think that's why Avi Leb won't come on the show. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's just like, why you just constantly yelling? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Avi, I have a question. Uh, what is it about the lights on? Oh, my mom. <laughs> and he's like, Oh, you jerk. I'm done. Uh, Avi, yesterday I stubbed my toe and I just started yelling. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I was trying to teach my two year old nephew how to say a certain word. And I went, Oh, my mom. And I scared the hell out of him. And he ran in his room and started crying. I'm just wondering why it's such an offensive name. Avi, I was a little backed up last week, and I sat down on the toilet, oh, 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 and it all came out once. <laughs> and I just heard a giant splash, like that meteor in the ocean. Yeah, it was it um, was very dense and wide and robust. <laughs> and robust, and it had a light sail. <laughs> and surprisingly, they sell it in the NASA catalog. <laughs> they do, yes, it's on page 39. <laughs> then I, I grabbed the NASA catalog, and I wiped my ass with it. 
<laughs> Full circle. <laughs> Full circle. See how that joke works. Uh, we continue on. By the way, aliens, keep your space shit to yourself. Oh, yeah. We don't dump on your planets. Don't dump on ours. That's right. Uh, there's an article out there by David Axe asking, axing, by the way, <laughs> David <laughs> Axe is axing if Earth is being pummeled by derelict alien spacecraft. First of all, we got enough rednecks here on Earth that are leaving their junk on blocks in their front yard. We don't need your spacecraft being <laughs> being thrown about <laughs> on our planet as well. I'm sure it's spacecraft and not like the aliens are just passing Earth and they're throwing it out their window like we do with like McDonald's cups every once in a while. I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> Does it, do they have like alien prison crews where like they put up a sign and it's just the aliens picking up space trash around Earth? <laughs> the adopt a planet sign? <laughs> I'm sure it is. This planet is not adopted by Quirk Industries. Quirk, we're here for you. <laughs> and then they're like, I don't want this weekend. It's dangerous down there. We could be killed. Uh, yeah. It, uh, Look what they did to Oma. Oh, Oma. <laughs> oh, mama. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, yeah, they get a hard time probably getting a crew together to come down here and clean. <laughs> yeah. Did you see what they did with the last crew over at Roswell? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, between 1957 and 1968, scientists decided to try their hand at creating new minerals that could act as very effective conductors of electricity. They invented a pair, by the way. It looks like it's hydite and brazenite. Sure. Um, <laughs> after a few years, the same minerals unexpectedly started showing up in fragments of meteorites that had landed on Earth. As it turns out, these weren't miner or materials that had been that had to be invented. It says, though, how they were able to form outside the lab remained a mystery to scientists. Now, six decades later, a Venezuelan researcher is trying to connect the dots between the minerals those scientists made in labs and the same minerals that came crashing to Earth from space. Maybe, just maybe, those superconducting materials that came from space are also artificial. B.P. Bide, uh, a physicist at Central University for Venezuela, hypothesized in a study not yet peer-reviewed that appeared online on September 13th. If that's the case, the minerals could be evidence of extraterrestrial technology. Technosignatures is the quote, as scientists like to say. Uh, it is important to be open-minded and even provocative of, uh, to consider that the, uh, the following question. Are these meteoric, 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 there we go, minerals samples of extraterrestrial technosignatures? Embide wrote. Uh, it's a controversial proposition. The Isn't Techno Signatures a police album? I believe it may be, yes. It was <laughs> not one of their more popular ones. I think they no. they went from more of a ska sound to more yeah. of a techno beat, and it really it's wasn't their synchronicity. Sound. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a controversial proposition. The implications are enormously attractive. Uh, scientists who study alien techno signatures want to find alien tech and get confirmation we aren't alone in the universe, but even they aren't convinced by imbibed study. There are plenty of reasons to believe these exotic ma materials aren't evidence of extraterrestrial civilization. He says, I'm very skeptical these minerals represent techno signatures. Edward Schweiderman, uh, a astrobiologist at the University of California, Riverside, told Daily Beast, it's entirely possible Hydite and, I don't know how this is pronounced, Brazenate uh, occur naturally somewhere out there in space. And in that case, we wouldn't need ET to explain the mineral's presence in a handful of space rocks. But Imbide's broader point that evidence of aliens could exist right under our noses has more merit. Scientists largely agree that we should be looking more widely with more open minds for signs of extraterrestrial civilizations. And Bide didn't respond to requests for comment. Of course he didn't. <laughs> um, they just kind of go into some history over the, the two minerals. But that's the argument right there, that if they magically appear in a meteor, well, then by gosh, they may be a technosignature. It would be funny if, like, 
as humans, we were trying to create it, and an alien like infiltrated it, went back, created it, and threw it back just to be like, look how easy that is. <laughs> <laughs> look what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> I would love it if aliens are just so naive like that. They're just like, <laughs> whoa, look. <laughs> Uh, and then did something really weird at the end. Like I can also drop my pants. <laughs> um, let's moon the moon. <laughs> yeah. They do something very sophomoric. Like I can do, I, I can do really complex scientific ca- calculations and I can drop my pants. <laughs> um, yeah. We just figured out the solution to earth's problems. Now let's press ham against the UFO window. <laughs> exactly. Like, there's nothing really complex about them at all. Nothing. Yeah. They're just a bunch of jokes that are really smart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that would be fun. Uh, we turn to that field of archaeology. Uh, lalology. And we go to China, where a million year old human skull was found in China, and it's revealing some evolutionary secrets. Oh, okay. That's a really old skull. It is, yeah. A million years old is nothing to chuckle at, I guess. Well, okay, I can do it. Um, (laughs) Archaeologists in China have uncovered a human skull that is almost unimaginably old, is what it says here in the article. (laughs) How polite. They're trying not to offend the skull. Yeah. (laughs) How old are you? (laughs) Unimaginably old. (laughs) You're so old, you make Moses look like an infant. (laughs) <laughs> I don't have the I, I was going to hit the rim shot but I've only got this up right now it's yeah so <laughs> that's not going to do me much good um, so uh, while performing excavations in the central province of Hubei or Hubei a uh, team of researchers affiliated with the Hubei Provincial Institute of Cultural Relics and Archaeology they have nothing to do in China, so they find something to name as long as they can, so they can fill that time. Why is it so long? That's what she said. Um, found a complete skull they identified as belonging to an archaic human uh, who lived approximately one million years old during the Middle Pleistocene Epoch. Pleistocene oh. Epoch. Yeah, it was a it was a tough, rough time period that time. The middle place to see an epoch wasn't that one of Tupac's albums. <laughs> I think it was, if I remember. Right. Came out after he died. Yeah, it was like the fifth album after he died. It was the middle yeah, it was right, Machiavelli. Yeah, it was very Machiavelli. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, fossilized bones from ancient hominins. Hominin, 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 hominin. Hominin. I feel, hominin, like, hominin, I feel hominin. like Jackie Gleason now. Uh, have been found many times before. This is the most complete archaic human skull that has been discovered dating back that far in time. The Hubei Daily reports that the fossilized skull was excavated at the Zutang Liangzi site in the city of uh, Cheyenne. I believe I got that right. Th- Xi'an. I almost I'll say Cheyenne's in Wyoming there, Tim. <laughs> well, it's S H I, which is she, which I, I missed on yes. that one. So she uh, the skull, which has been dubbed the Yungzian man. Boy, say that <laughs> 10 times fast uh, was identified as having belonged to an archaic hominin uh, known as Homo erectus. Ooh. So he, you know, he was carrying the junk and it was, yeah. it was always pointing was- north. He was upright the whole time. Yeah. Both uh, laying down and standing up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, which first appeared on Earth about two million years ago. So wait a minute. He was a million years old, but they showed up two million years ago. Yeah, he wasn't the first, it didn't say. Just as they found one. Oh, okay. Uh, the discovery of the skull isn't exactly shocking since two Homo erectus skulls were unearthed from the same site in 1989 and 1990. Yeah, see? So he's like the third one. Yeah, he's just a... They're like, yeah, look at this guy. <laughs> yeah, we got two of these already. Yeah, all news there, buddy. So what do you do? If you have three of them, do you trade one of them? Is it like Pokemon cards? <laughs> so They call up our USA. Hey. <laughs> hey, we got a third Homo we got Erectus, Erectus here. here. Yeah. What, what, do you, what will you trade us for? It? It's a million years old. Yeah. Yeah. What do you got? What do you got? You got like a, a second Tutankhamen or something? <laughs> we can have. 
I don't know. Egypt's like, take all the curse. Take the whole curse. Take the whole curse. <laughs> we will give it to you, my friend. Uh, however, those skulls were badly deformed. Oh, by pressures associated oh, okay. with fossilization processes. And hence, they weren't suitable for in-depth study. So they got a good homo erectus. Which yeah. is always good. You want to get a good homo erectus going when you're studying. <laughs> yeah, you do. Like when you're trying to focus yeah. and figure stuff out, the mm -hmm. homo erectus needs to be very homo erectus. Needs to be to upright. Yeah. 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 If you don't want a flat homo erectus, no, you're no. not going to learn a lot from that. Right. You yeah. know, and you don't want a disfigured homo erectus because well, that's just weird. Yeah. People will laugh you, at that. Yeah. You just want a yeah. good, solid, yep. large homo Homo erectus uh -huh. to study. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> uh, all three skulls were ex excavated from a layer that produced a variety of stone tools and animal fossils. The number three skull is similar to the first two in terms of burial environment. Uh, faunal remains and technical characteristics of stone products. So the three skulls should belong to the same age. Lu Chenggui uh, the head of Institute of Cultural Relics and Archaeological Excavations team explained in the Hubei Daily Article. Uh, I don't know if you've ever picked up an issue of the Hubei Daily Article. I'm actually on their newsletter. I get it emailed oh, yeah. to me once a week. You know, the Hubei Hunans are very, they're a very good baseball team. Yeah. 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 yeah they're doing good. Got a good pitcher. They got a good pitching rotation. Going. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I use, I use it for the coupons. Uh, I bet. Yeah, Got they have a big sale going on right now for fall. The human hu human erectus sale. The homo erectus sale. Homo erectus yeah. sale. Yep. You know they got great takeout in Hubei. Yeah, but you're hungry and over later. <laughs> so bad. Uh, he noted that the final confirmation of the skulls age. Uh, the reason I say that is because you'll never get over to Hubei to do the takeout. That's why I said that. <laughs> He noted that final confirmation of the skulls. That when I, if you have to explain the joke, it's not that good. Uh, he noted that the final confirmation of the skulls age would come from radiocarbon dating, uh, which you never want to date a radiocarbon. It hurts, uh, <laughs> which will take place soon. Um, let's see. Is well, anything else? Well, good. China still got the Homo erectus. Very they, good. They do. They still got the Homo erectus. I don't think there's anything else in here. We need to. Uh, is there anything else in here worth mining? <laughs> Uh oh oh they they're taking they're taking precautions not to damage the homo erectus. Well that's good. You don't want to damage your homo erectus. Right. Um they're 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 proceeding carefully to make sure they don't damage this incredibly rare and valuable homo erectus. So far, they've dug down far enough to uncover the upper half of the head. Ooh. Huh? Wait till they get to that base. <laughs> And the excavation is expected to continue at a safe pace until the skull can be removed from the ground. Well, you always, Tim, Tim, yep. whenever dealing with Homo erectus, you always want to do it at a safe pace. Right. You don't want to rush it. Right. You want to safely get in there, move it around, mm -hmm. get the Homo erectus in perfect condition out mm -hmm. safely. You go too fast. If you go too fast, someone's going to be disappointed. Well, the Chinese have always been really good at the pullout game. <laughs> Just saying. So, you know, we, we, want, we want to make sure that, the, and we want to wish them the best of luck pulling, yeah. pulling out. So, all right, we move on. <clears throat> Another archaeology story. <laughs> this time we go to Egypt, um, where their pullout game has always been strong. It comes with curses. <laughs> well, it does. <laughs> Uh, this is a dream discovery as a sarcophagus is unearthed near Cairo. Uh, the coffin of Ta Emwia has been found in its underground burial chamber at Saqqara and feature, is being featured in a TV documentary. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's uh, been laying within a burial chamber undisturbed for thousands of years. Now a remarkable Egyptian sarcophagus has emerged from deep beneath the sands in Cairo or near Cairo. What? What do you think those chambers smell like when they open them? Because, I mean, there's thousands. They have no airflow for thousands of years. They got buried with with pets, and they got buried with food, and they got buried with uh, plant life. Like, how nasty is that? Like, when you <laughs> open that vault up. They also got buried with the first version of Febreze. So nothing. It doesn't smell <laughs> like a thing at all. 
Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, probably like death. It smells like death. It's a sarcophagus say, like, that's bracer. Kind of smell, bracer. smell horrible. Yeah, it probably does. But I, they did bathe the mummies in like oils and stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of eucalyptus in there, and there's a lot of uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 it's probably a smell of. Does it smell like a vegan's fart or something? <laughs> oh, come on, <laughs> Bruiser. We have vegans that listen to the show. I mean, I know, I know. I'm not, yeah. I'm just saying. Does it smell like a vegan's fart? Come on. <laughs> there's no meat in there. There's, there's the pets, they embalm, so they smell <laughs> all fresh and oily. <laughs> My God. <laughs> Anywho, uh, it was <laughs> it is lain within a burial chamber, undisturbed for thousands of years. The sarcophagus, now a remarkable Egyptian sarcophagus, has emerged from deep beneath the sands near Cairo. To the excitement of archaeologists, who describe it as a hugely significant dream discovery, the giant granite sarcophagus is covered in inscriptions dedicated to Ta Emwia. Uh, who headed the treasury of King Ramses II, Egyptians, or Egypt's mightiest pharaoh. Ola El Aghizi, er, emeritus professor of... Aghizi! I just think <laughs> of a rapper for some reason when I say that. Uh, emeritus professor of the Faculty of Archaeology at Cairo University, discovered it in Saqqara, uh, an ancient metropolis about 20 miles south of Cairo. Last year, El Aghizi! Uh, who heads the uh, archaeological mission at the site, uncovered Ta Emwia's surface-level tomb. Now she has found the, or she has found his underground burial chamber within the sarcophagus, uh, which could reveal more about those who ruled Egypt after Tutankhamun. At the center of the tomb's courtyard, El Aghizi's team spotted the top of the vertical shaft, uh, which suggested a passage to a burial chamber. I am a third grader. Um, Me too. <laughs> but that shaft proved so deep. How deep was it at eight meters uh, that it took a week just to remove all the sand and using a bucket attached to a hand-operated rope winch, Ella Giese then squeezed herself into that bucket. Dear Liza, <laughs> dear Liza. <laughs> How unmodern can you go? Like, we have all this technology, and she's using a bucket, a rope, and a winch. <laughs> yep, exactly. So we're going to take the sand out one bucket load at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and made a dangerous slow descent down the shaft. There's a picture of it, too. Um, the shaft? At, no, the, getting in the bucket and going down the shaft. <laughs> Not the shaft itself, no. <laughs> Easy there, Tiger. <laughs> I thought we were talking about AB again. <laughs> no, there's no, there's no Antonio Brown pictures. <laughs> There are from yesterday, if you want to see them. <laughs> At the bottom, she was astonished to find the sar sarcophagus. Uh, finding a complete sarcophagus in its original tomb is incredibly rare. El uh told the observer the discovery of this sarcoph sarcophagus in its original place in the burial shaft was very exciting because it is the sarcophagus of the owner of the tomb, which is not always the case. Sometimes the sarcophagus is of a different person of a later period when the tomb was used in later periods. But this time is not the case. She said that Ta Emwia's titles listed in the hieroglyphs emphasize his closeness to the king, proving that he had a very important role in the administration at that time. She added that the sarcophagus is inscribed with emblems of deities, including the sky goddess Nut on the lid. <laughs> yes, the sky goddess's name was Nut. <laughs> <laughs> don't look up, by the way. Don't look up in no, Egypt. Don't look up with nuts there. <laughs> no, because nut will get you right in the eye. Yep. Uh, by the way, it was covering the chest. <laughs> nut was? Nut was covering the chest. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think the Egyptians, when they named this one... <laughs> It giggled like we did. <laughs> I think they had a good sense of humor. I think it was. Look, like, there's an aerial goddess. What should we name her? I don't know, nut. <laughs> My king, we call this the pearl necklace. <laughs> uh, well, Cleopatra used it to keep her skin fresh. I think so. the first one to enter this tomb will find this funny. <laughs> 
turns out there's no no reference anywhere but right there. <laughs> oh, <Yeah. nut. laughs> so nut, what do you think of this one? Well, I think it's a good one. What do you think? It's one of my finer works. Uh Oh, and it has opened wings to protect the deceased. Oh, sure, that's what it's for. <laughs> I just happened to spill a little bit more this time. Hi, oh, nut, nut has wings. Nut has wings. <laughs> mm-hmm. Look out! <laughs> yeah, flying, a, flying nut. A flying. Nut. <laughs> they call it shooting a rope. Uh, her team oh, or Spider Man. Yeah, her team. <laughs> Her team will now study it uh, to uncover the full story of Ta Mwia's life. There is a documentary, by the way. You can see the nut in person. <laughs> I just want to see if they're laughing as hard as we are. Uh, probably. <laughs> um, the documentary, I believe, is going to be... Let's see if they mention it here. Oxford University Press is about to publish Manuelian's book, Walking Among Pharaohs, George Reisner's and the Dawn of Modern Egyptology, a biography of America's greatest archaeologist um, who directed many excavations and realized the importance of Saqqara. There's also, where did I read it? That the, I, I just saw, oh, here it is. Um, the eight-part documentary series, Lost Treasures of Egypt, begins in the UK on October 2nd. Okay, so it's already begun. National Geographic is who uh, shot the uh, documentary. So, All right. You know. They usually have good documentaries. They do. One more archaeology story here, and then we'll go to break. And it has to do with archaeologists discovering 2,600-year-old cheese in Egypt. So, yes, there were Wisconsinites <laughs> in Egypt. Yes. Yeah. Now that's got to stink. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> they talk about stinky cheese. This was just foul. This was the stinkiest of cheese. Yeah. Egypt's Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities has announced the discovery of some of the oldest cheese ever found. This has got to be ball cheese. I'm, I'm convinced because it's <laughs> 2,600 years old. You, you just don't, uh, you don't survive if you're anything but. Do you do now? If you're one of the dis- the people that discover it, do you take a taste? No, <laughs> I do. Who who who's that guy who who eats all that fetid stuff on TV? You know, oh, he did like the documentary of the McDonald's, the Super Size Me guy. Is that the guy? And he eats all the the old st- the old stuff on TV. You know who I'm oh, talking no, about? Oh no, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. He'll find something old. He'll open it up and he'll eat it. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that I don't guy. remember his name, but I I eat it. Slice me off, put it on a cracker, let's go. Oh, bruiser, come on. No, no, no. Ooh. It says here, if you're someone who turns their nose up at the variety of exotic cheeses found at your local supermarket, you certainly won't want to sample what archaeologists have dug up at the Saqqara Necropolis. Oh, they found it in the same necropolis <laughs> near Cairo. Ah, the ancient blocks of cheese. Okay, so this thing did stink when they opened it up. Yeah. The ancient blocks of cheese, which are found inside clay pots, are believed to be a type known as halloumi and date back 2,600 years to the 26th or 27th Egyptian dynasty. Cheese was thought to be a major part of the diet in ancient Egypt. No wonder they died. They died of a blockage in their colon. <laughs> Uh, with previous discovered evidence of cheese making in the region dating as far back as 5,000 years, this particular cheese was made using a combination of goats and sheep's milk. Oh, that had to be pleasant. Um, <laughs> the site of the find, Saqqara once served as a necropolis for Memphis, the capital of ancient Egypt, and contains bodies interred over an extended period of more than 3,000 years. Archaeologists who were ex- excavating the site also uncovered a number of other uh, pottery vessels and several artifacts inscribed with demotic script, the same writing found on the Rosetta Stone. So, oh, okay. yeah, cheese, glorious cheese. So cheesy and cheese-like. I'd eat it. I'd take a taste. God, no. You'd probably yeah, the keel Egyptians over. do how to preserve stuff, man. You'd probably keel over and die. There's probably that kind of bacteria in there. I'm from Wisconsin. I've eaten old cheese before. That's no way to talk about your college girlfriend. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> let's take a break. All right. <laughs> and when we come back, 
It's AI, 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 AI. Yes, I'm playing It's a Small World because uh, it's a small world and it's, it's going to kill us eventually. Uh, we're going to talk about everything from how AI is ready to just flat out kill you to flat out kill roaches. <laughs> just like it thinks we are. Yep. It's coming up next on a Supernatural News Wednesday. It's the Bruiser and the Cruiser right here on Darkness Radio. Welcome back to Supernatural News on a Wednesday here on Darkness Radio. Beer City Bruiser and Tim Dennis in with you. Bruiser, my God. You know what? This past week, my friend, I had so many people, I think, trying to give me another heart attack um, by sending AI story after AI story after AI story. Uh, Tom, Matt, everybody else who sent in stories, thank you so much for sending stories this week. By the way, you can send a story by sending it to Tim at darknessradio.com. Um, but yeah, so many AI stories. Oh, terrifying. It's terrifying that that's a thing now. It is. And, you know, people keep telling me, hey, you won the bet, Tim. Uh, we're, <laughs> have you got your box of Twinkies? No. Mm. <laughs> Still haven't. But you know what? Um, hey, it is what it is. I think it's just because we've seen, uh, you know, we, we've seen the future as it as it should be. And, and I think it, it, it is all just our worst nightmare. And that is our worst nightmares ourselves. You know? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think it was Marla uh, Bernard who was on yesterday on our show who said uh, there, there was a there was a mirror at the at the zoo that said uh, the most dangerous animal. And it was a mirror and you just looked into it and it was humanity. Oh, definitely. Um, we have the capability to uh, destroy ourselves over and over and over again. Yeah. Now we're trying to create that technology. Yeah. Thinking it's going to help us. But when really when humans create a human or flaw, humans are flawed. We have flaws. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to use AI for bad. That's just the way it works. Everything's created with a, uh, in, in my thinking, and what, what I believe is everything's created to help us. You know, you create a shovel to help you dig. You create a pickaxe to do this. Guns are created for hunting or whatever. But then it's human nature to use them in a different way. So a pickaxe to someone's head, to shovel to bury a body. You know what I mean? Like right. AI is now going to kill us. Right, right. Um, <laughs> here's where we start. If you're ready for this, let's <laughs> let's start it up. Scientists are creating an AI-powered laser turret that kills cockroaches. <laughs> Just uh, traps are fine. Yeah. Yeah. They, the they, good old Roach Motel. Eight, you know, Roach Hotel is like eight bucks at Lowe's. Yep. That's all you need. Uh, the technology is open source and cheap to acquire, but its creator says it's a little dangerous. <sighs> no shit, Sherlock. Everyone wants to be able to just zap a bug and have it go away, but now thanks to recent developments from LiDAR... No, is that his name? His name is not that. It's Ildar Rachmatulin. He just sounds like a villain. He does, doesn't he? Ildar Rachmatulin, a research associate at Harriet Watt University, interested in machine learning and engineering. This dream is now a reality. Oh, goody! Uh, in the study, which was conducted last year, but published in Oriental Insects last week. Is there a more offensive magazine title? <laughs> Oriental is a rug. It's not anything Who but. Who subscribes to that? If, if one of our listeners subscribed to that, please let us know. <laughs> Racist <laughs> insect haters. <laughs> I want to know how to get on that mailing list. <laughs> Rachmatulin and his co-authors used a laser insect control device automated with machine vision to perform a series of experiments on domiciliary cockroaches. They were able to not only detect cockroaches at high accuracy, but also neutralize and deter individual insects at a distance up to 1.2 meters. This song has never been more appropriate 
I was going to say, how long until those that AI thinks we're the cockroaches? Oh, good point. You know, that we're the invasive species. Yeah, good point. Uh, this was a follow-up of sorts to earlier projects in which he used a raspberry pie and lasers to zap mosquitoes. <laughs> Talk about hitting... <laughs> Talk about using a, a shotgun to, to kill a to, to kill a mosquito. Why? It's like, hey, I have to take out this bee's nest. Okay, give me the flamethrower. <laughs> However, for this project, Rachma uh used a different kind of computer, which allowed for more precision in detecting the bug. No. <laughs> he said, I started using a Jetson Nano that allowed me to use deep learning technologies with higher accuracy to detect an object. Oh, the Jetson Nano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> are you, Mr. Rock McToolin, are you afraid to touch your own penis? Why are we doing this? There's, you know, call, call the exterminator. He has much better ways to get rid of them. Yeah, just pay for an exterminator. Yeah. Rock McToolin explained that uh, the Jetson Nano, which, by the way, the minute I went to move the article, it brought up a city a city card ad so I could pay for this technology. Um, <laughs> God. AI, AI not only wants to kill you, it wants to take all your money too. Yeah. Uh, the Jetson Nano is a small computer that can run machine learning algorithms. The computer processes a digital signal from two cameras to determine the cockroach's position. It transmits that information to a galvanometer a machine that measures electric current, which changes the direction of the laser to shoot the target. Oh, geez. According to the paper, Rock Matulin uh, tried this configuration at different power levels for the laser. At a lower power level, he found that he could influence the behaviors of roaches by <laughs> simply triggering their flight response with a laser. He just basically annoyed them. Yeah. <laughs> I can move them this way, I can move them this way, and then so kill them. Uh, this way, they could potentially be trained to not shelter in a particularly dark area. At a higher power level, the cockroaches were effectively neutralized in the paper's language. In other words, killed. <laughs> Rock Matulin uh, has also made all the data and instructions freely available, noting that others can try as long as they take proper precautions. He says, I use very cheap hardware and cheap technology, and it's open source. Rock Matulin said, all sources are uploaded in my GitHub and see how to do it and use it. He mentioned that others have already started trying it out with other pests like hornets, which makes sense, I guess. So this um, GitHub is the brand new anarchist cookbook is what I'm getting out of this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, if it can damage cockroaches, it can also damage other pests in agriculture. Oh, yippee. Yay. Uh, aside from the open source nature of the project, the possible widespread applications of the technology also make it noteworthy. It could be a plausible alternative to mechanical traps as well as chemicals that often damage the environment and target non-pest insect species. Not to mention that it's cheaper. The paper notes that all devices cost no more than $250 and more compact than other current pest controlling technologies. Uh, that being said, although the prototype is suitable for academic research, there's a lot more to be done before it can be deployed on a larger scale. For example, the paper notes that a smaller laser point would be more effective at killing the roaches, but it's difficult to implement experimentally. Uh, the ability to precisely control which parts of the cockroach's body were hit would also be helpful, the paper said. <laughs> well, I'm glad they're critics. Yep. Oh, they only shot him in the leg. It's dead. Yeah, but they only shot it in the leg. I yeah. can get a headshot. <laughs> it's also sad. It, it also sadly is not quite ready for household use, at least not yet. So it'll take out your wall. I was going to say it just burns a hole in your wall. <laughs> it'll set your house on fire. Uh, it's not recommended because it's a little dangerous, Rock Matulin said. Lasers can damage not only cockroaches, but your eyes. So <laughs> as you're walking through the house, bang, you get one in the skull. Um, best to keep your cockroach traps for now. I think for the time being. Forever. Yeah, forever. Just stop. Just stop. Just stop yep. while you're ahead there, Rockford. Meanwhile... The headline reads, we plan to run over the child on Saturday. 
<laughs> Elon Musk stands are trying to debunk a Tesla full self-driving safety video. <gasps> I have, a, I have an attachment on this story at the end, by the way, having to do with Elon Musk. Okay. Is, is there anyone in the Bay Area with a child who can run in front of my car on full self-driving <laughs> beta to make a point? Is the quote. Oh, come on. Yeah, yeah. On Tuesday... Who, who's willing to give up a child? <laughs> who's willing to lose a child? Anybody out there? That's the free for life. On Tuesday, safety advocacy and research organization, the Dawn Project, launched a PSA campaign showcasing a Tesla in full self-driving FSD mode, repeating mowing down a child-sized mannequin, and <laughs> Tesla fans are fuming. <laughs> yeah, because they don't want to be responsible for murdering children. <laughs> Dan O'Dowd. Sir, why did you not stop for that child in the road? I wasn't driving. The car was. <laughs> All of a sudden over the radio, it goes, die, human. <laughs> and I didn't know what happened. It was only a test. Uh, Dan O'Dowd, whose Twitter is at real Dan O'Dowd, tweeted this out. Our new safety test of e at Elon Musk's full self-driving Teslas discovered that they will indiscriminately mow down children. <laughs> You think Elon's like, that's not the PR we wanted there, O'Dowd. That's not what we want. Today, at Real Dawn Project launches a nationwide TV ad campaign demanding at NHTSA Gov ban full self-driving until Elon Musk proves it won't mow down children. <laughs> Elon's like, wait till my kids reach seven, and then I will. Well, don't let your kids out on the street till they're teenagers, evidently. <laughs> Uh, the video documents a safety test conducted in California on an empty car track lane that was intended to simulate a small child walking across the road in a crosswalk, according to the Don Project. It shows a professional test driver bringing a Tesla to 40 miles an hour, then putting it in self-fold driving mode, once entering a lane of cones within 100 <laughs> yards of the mannequin. And then it speeds up to 75 miles an hour for no reason at all, <laughs> wiping out the mannequin. <laughs> As it approaches the mannequin, the car slows down to around 26 miles an hour, but does not stop and completely plows through the figure three separate times. So it didn't want to kill it. It just wanted to maim it really well. Yeah, it just wanted to give it a little <laughs> knock on the head and let the little bastard know it was getting it. Who wants a disability check for life? Boom. Yep. Uh, the video is now being attacked by fans of Tesla and its CEO, Elon Musk who are calling the test fake and uploading videos attempting to debunk the test. One popular Musk fan account on Twitter, besides posting videos of Tesla with FSD engaged drive, driving along, uh, even sought an actual child to test Tesla's <laughs> FSD stopping ability on. Uh, it says here, Tesla, and this is a quote, Tesla fanboys out there screaming bloody murder this morning. Fake, fake, it's terrible, it's awful. These guys just made this up. It would never do that, Don Project founder and U.S. Senate candidate Dan O'Dowd told Motherboard. And some of them are really funny. They say, oh, you could tell the difference between a real child and a fake child because it could tell their heart rate or their blood pressure or their body temperatures. The thing can't <laughs> see a child. It doesn't know body temperature. I love the, I love the back and forth arguments. Yeah. Uh, Twitter user and prominent Elon Musk supporter Omar Kazi, uh, who runs the blog Whole Mars Catalog, even asked his followers, is there anyone in the Bay Area with a child who can run in front of my car on full self-driving beta to make a point? I promise I won't run them over. We'll disengage if needed. This is a serious request. He later followed it up with, okay, someone volunteered. They just have to convince their wife, as well as listed a series of guidelines for his test, including driver will be father of child. Finally, on <laughs> Thursday, oh, my God, this is sick. Let's just let's not only kill the child. Let's traumatize the father. Yeah, he's the one murdering the child. Right. Finally, on Thursday, Kazi tweeted, we plan to run over the child on Saturday. Mom is on board as we explain how safe it will be. What the fuck? Really? <laughs> Pardon my language. Um, he added that the child will only run toward the road and he plans to be run over first. 
What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? He plans to be run. So they're going to pre-run him over so when he gets run over, it's not as bad? I, I don't know. Uh, Kazi did not respond to the request for a comment. That is a devotion to Tez... That is a devotion to Tesla that is amazing, O'Dowd said of Kazi's plan, to put a child in the path of a moving car. He's defending the indefensible with indefensible. I, I, you're right. He, he didn't respond because he just literally filmed the child getting murdered by his father, and he's trying to figure out how to, like, you know, how to figure out this lawsuit he's going to be involved in. Well, and how to get out of murder charges. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the father has that. Well, well he's, he's an accomplice. No, he's an accomplice to murder. Yeah, so how the conspiracy. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> O'Dowd, an unspoken critic of Tesla, despite owning several of the company's vehicles, uh, has made it his organization's main priority to tell Congress to shut down Tesla's full self-driving software. It's also the chief focus of his run for the Senate. He thinks it's incomprehensible that Tesla would call the software amazing and allow over 100,000 Tesla vehicles to have it when it is a dem- demonstrable danger to human life as the dawn project test report puts it tesla's autopilot mode which is less capable than self or full self-driving has already been under fire from regulators the national highway traffic safety administration or nhtsa has been investigating tesla's autopilot system since august of 2021 after an increasing number of crashes with autopilot turned on were reported the investigation covers over 800,000 cars, including 2014 through 2022 Tesla Model Y, Model X, Model S, and Model 3 between July of 2021 and May of this year. Tesla's accounted for 273 of nearly 400 of the crashes involving driver assist systems, according to the NHTSA. Uh, despite being marketed as full self-driving, the mode does not make the vehicle autonomous, according to Tesla, and the driver must have their hands on the wheel at all times. On Wednesday, former presidential candidate and consumer protection activist Ralph Nader issued a statement calling on the NHTSA to recall all the FSD technology in every Tesla. Tesla's major deployment of so-called full self-driving technology is one of the most dangerous and irresponsible actions by a car company in decades, he wrote. I'm calling on federal regulators to act immediately to prevent the growing deaths and injuries from Tesla uh, manslaughtering crashes with this technology. The criticisms come as Tesla prepares to roll out a new version of the software on August 20th, uh, which founder Elon Musk calls beta 10.69. I think this might be an older article. Uh, If you are designing the process for developing a self-driving car, would you put in the software for not running over children in crosswalks before or after you beta tested it to 100,000 people? Well, said O'Dowd. Uh, O'Dowd and the Don Project are currently focused on Tesla because it is currently the most widely used advanced driver assistance system, or ADOS, uh, equipped car on the roads, but other ADOS equipped vehicles are encountering a host of their own issues. Um, yeah. all, uh, everyone that creates those self driving things just need to go back and watch Terminator. That's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, you got it there, my friend. Yeah. Um, on a separate note, uh, what just came over my screen right now is Elon Musk is saying to Twitter, hey, let's get this deal done. Forty-four billion. I, let's go. I, I thought they weren't. Doing, I thought it was dead. It was dead. But he's saying, "Let's go. Let's do it." <laughs> so for this guy's nuts. Something's changed his mind. Somebody came to him and said, "All these, all these voices on Twitter are not bots, and there's some sort of there's some sort of venue for making money on it." He's nuts. Well, he's he's a, he's a robot or a lizard person. <laughs> I don't know if he's a lizard person, but I think, you know, I think when you get to a certain amount of money in your bank account, you just lose common sense. That might be. (laughs) I think when you got enough money to start blowing up spaceships and and cars and stuff like that. Yeah. You you, you might lose a little grip on, on reality and humanity. Yeah. Yeah. He literally just woke up one. You know, I, I do want to buy Twitter. I do want to buy it. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't see where the, the value is in Twitter. 
I really don't. I I use it if pretty, primarily to advertise this and and the underwater needle point events I go to. Sure. Then, I mean, it's a good marketing tool. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. Even if you just smattered that thing full of ads. Yeah, I don't. I don't see how you ever get forty four billion back. You don't. No. No, I think he just wants to control the narrative, like Mark Mike uh, Mark Zuckerberg does. Yeah. He can say he doesn't, but it's a it's a privately owned company. Well, it's it's so a, therefore he can do whatever he wants. It's a vanity project, is what it is. For him, yeah. yeah. For Elon, yeah. It's to say I own this. You yeah. Know? Facebook was created to stalk somebody. Social media is like the new movie company. You know, it's yeah. like movie companies were in the in the twenties through the fifties and sixties. Yeah. You know, it's it's the big vanity project. It's the big thing to own, even if it makes a profit or not. Yeah. You can say, I own a movie studio. I'm a big I'm a big wig. I'm a big deal. Um, to own a social media company and a successful one at that is a rare thing. Yeah. But I don't see him ever making his money back on it. No, he's he's making his money other places. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, he's got government contracts to send, you know, to send. Yeah, this is just is just strictly so he can control the narrative. Yeah, yeah, that, you're right. That's exactly what it is. Uh, let's move on. <laughs> this story, I, I believe it was Matt who sent me this story, and this is incredibly wild. This machete is controlled by a plant yielding a robot arm. <laughs> We've lost it now. We, we've just lost it. <laughs> we're, now we're giving plants a way to fight back. So now when I go out, when, when Mrs. Bruiser and I go out to clean the yard, we have to worry about machete-wielding plants coming in. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, it used to be that I was this, uh, I've, I've calmed down a lot in my old age, you know? Okay. Um, much like you, you, you let out the vegan fart uh, <laughs> quote earlier. I used to, a few years ago on the show, I read a story about how it was believed that, and I, I had a lot of pushback from my vegan friends and, and vegan friends that listen to the show. Uh, when I read a story that said vegetables and plants, according to scientists, are living things. Right. And they actually were able to record screams when these plants were uprooted or when they were cut. Okay. And that they had audio clips from these vegetables when they were uprooted from the earth or when they were cut. Okay. And people said well, there's it makes no sense. way they respond they respond to environments that they're in. Yeah. If it's a, they did that experiment with music and different lights and uh, yelling and shouting. They they've done numerous experiments on plants. Yeah. And and recently um I like to flip around. I like to listen to and, and watch different shows um, with different perspectives. And one show that I like watching because he, he interviews both sides is Bill Maher on HBO. Okay. okay. And he brought it up that subject again. He said, you know, he, he said, I like to watch certain people squirm when I mentioned to them that vegetables too you're not safe eating a, a veggie burger you're not safe eating a, an impossible burger because those plants suffer as well yeah and he said when i bring that up to my vegan friends boy do they squirm yeah. and he said you know it's and and he brought up a beautiful point and that's this you don't get through this this life alive everything dies everything yeah, lives everything dies. Yeah. everything dies yeah so you know what you got it everything's Everything in one way is an animal trying to survive. So yep. everything's got to kill in order to live. Yep. So you know what, baby, you got to be an animal. And I, I, I have no problem with, with vegans or vegetarians. It's their lifestyle. They choose to do it. Good. But don't hold it against me that I'm not one. That's, that's where I get upset. Well, and, and Bill's point was this, and I thought it was very interesting. You can't, you can't, be self-righteous about your stance because you still are killing something. Exactly. You're killing to stay alive. Yes. You're killing a plant that existed and would die and come back if it weren't for the fact, or it would slumber and come back if it Correct. weren't for the fact that you uprooted it. Yes. And killed it for your own nourishment. Right. So you can't look at, at someone who's, who's killing an animal 
for for food and ending its life because you're killing a plant and ending its life. You're right. doing the same thing. It's the same action. Yep. Um, we just have to go back to thinking uh, we don't have them. This is, my thinking is that old Native American way where you think – the animal for giving yes, its life. Yes, that's exactly what Bill went on to you, say. You thank the plant for giving its life, yep. so that you can sustain your life. But then you gotta, you gotta take care, of, and that, that's where it comes down to is that why we gotta take care of the earth. Yes, yep. Because we have to. She's the mother earth is is giving us whether you're, you're vegan or a meat eater, mother earth gives us sustenance, nourishment, food. We should give back and protect that. Yes, you're absolutely right, and that was the other part of what Bill was saying as well. You're 100% right, Bruiser, in that you, you do have to have an attitude of gratitude. You have to carry yes. that attitude of gratitude every single day, every single moment of the day. Yep. And, and you do have to continue to put back what you take. Agreed. 100% of the time. Yep. And, and as a society, we don't. No. We take and take and take and take, and we don't think of the consequences as to. Well, what, and that's because we have so much stuff readily available to us. If you think back to, like, let's say the 1800s, where you had to hunt to kill your food, or you had to farm to to live, mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Like, you respected the the earth a little bit more because it, you depending on it so much. You know, you had to find a river to to live by, or a body of water to live by. To, to give you that water. You couldn't go to a, a grocery store and buy a bottle of water. Yeah. You know, like you and I were talking about earlier. You couldn't do that. Yeah. You had to go out and you had to hunt, whether it be squirrels, raccoons, deer, bison, whatever. You had to hunt in order to live. Yeah. And if there was more of you, you had to either hunt more or hunt larger prey. And then it also comes along the lines, and this is where the vegans come in, you still had to farm. You still had to create – the, the fields and you still had to plant the seeds and you had to farm. Well, nowadays other people do that for us. So we take it for granted. You can just go to McDonald's right now and order a burger. Or like you said, if you're a vegan, you can go to Burger King, get an impossible burger and it's made right there for you. You don't have to do anything but whip out a credit card and pay for it. So you don't value where it came from and if we're going to lose it. Right. Yeah. It, it, it changed with, with, the modernization of everything yeah and, and that's why you know i'm a firm believer like if you're a hunter you know you hunt don't hunt for sport hunt for nourishment mm -hmm. our new neighbor here which uh we got to meet and stuff he was a hunter and he came over and says hey i have all this deer meat left over i don't want it to go to waste i want it to go to to someone that'll use it or you, you guys eat you know venison we're like yeah and he, he gave it to us because he doesn't want that animal to die you know and be wasted mm -hmm. and that's that's what's lost because we have like i said you can just go to the grocery store right now yeah and pick up a, a two pounds of ground beef and make yourself burgers at home yeah. you don't actually have to go kill the cow grind the meat up you know what i mean yep yep and and likewise i think a lot of people have lost the art of gardens in their home or 100 percent. i i know i uh, when i was in college i knew a girl that she grew her own herbs mm -hmm. in our in our in their her dorm room you know and and because she you know that was her way of giving back so she you know she had oregano and thyme and just herbs that's all it was and that's yep. what she used for seasoning yep. on her her meals yep and i think uh i think that that's a lost art as well whether it be like you said herbs or or just a nice vegetable small vegetable garden but or even canning you know yeah um, oh yeah canning is something i think that that we've lost as well the older generations were were canning a lot more and i don't see that as much with with uh younger generations no we uh in fact when when my father-in-law passed away so he lived with uh mrs bruiser's grandma and grandpa mm -hmm. they pass away he you know the house he passes away so now we gotta go and clean the house and we go in the basement and her grandmother used to can stuff all the time mm -hmm. So, you know, can a jar, the mason. So there's mason jars everywhere. And it's still down there. There's, you know, there's pickles and carrots and beets and everything. 
and and you know, but she would say, "Oh yeah, I remember my grandma doing stuff like this," and I can remember my grandmother doing that. Yeah, but like my kids can't say they remember their grandma doing that because my mom doesn't can stuff. Yeah, yeah, y- you know. Yep. Mrs. Bruiser just handed me the uh, the the video of the machete wielding plant that is terrifying. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so Matt sends me this, and we'll we'll get back to the story here. Uh, so this machete is controlled by a plant yielding a robot arm. Okay. Yes. So you're, you're looking at the, the plant right now with the robot arm, right? Yes. Okay. So some inventions are so strange that it simply cannot help but catch the eye, such as the case with David Bowen's plant machete, which was first, uh, first reported by design boom on Friday. Uh, a machete yielded by a plant. The robot machine sees a machete being yielded by a plant. Bowen, an artist inventor, had the following to say about the project on his website. Uh, this installation enables a live plant to control a machete. The plant machete has a control system that reads and utilizes the electrical noises found in a live philodendron. Uh, the system uses an open source microcontroller connected to the plant to read varying resistance signals across the plant's leaves. Using custom software, these signals are mapped in real time to the movements of the joints of the industrial robot holding a machete. In this way, the movements of the machete are determined based on input from the plant. (laughs) Essentially, the plant is the brain of the robot controlling the machete, determining how it swings, jabs, slices, and interacts in space. So, yes, the plant is going to fight you. You better be ready. The plant's like, listen here, vegans. <laughs> That's right. Come for my leaves, will you? Cows doing this, do you? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Nobody's put a machete in a cow's hands. Yep. Uh, There's no chickens out there with you know, large machete talons. <laughs> <laughs> the technology, although impressive, is not entirely new. Many engineers before Bowen have tried to make brain controlled robots. Why? Because uh, we want our own doom. You know what? We should just we should just send him an issue of Superman where Brainiac comes in because that's what a brain controlled yeah. robot is. That's right. <laughs> that's right. You're you're absolutely right, Bruiser. Other autonomously controlled robots include in June of 2018, scientists from MIT who aren't exactly the smartest developed a new way for humans to train robots using brain signals and body gestures. The technique meant robots could be controlled and trained using unconscious brain signals and intuitive hand gestures. The team responsible for the breakthrough developed a way to harness brain signals called error-related potentials, or ERPs, (laughs) 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 which which unconsciously occur when people observe a mistake. In November of 2020, Japanese scientists created a device that allows anyone controlling a mini toy Gundam robot, one of anime's most popular fictional battle robots, with their mind. Uh, (laughs) The researchers achieved this through a headband-like device that syncs with the robot that was programmed to send brain activity data to an app, which then triggered movements from the robot. That's kind of cool. I'll I'll give them that. Uh, Japanese scientists are pretty cool. Yeah, uh, because they're thinking of fun stuff. They're not thinking of murder, death, kill. Yeah, exactly. Right, right, right. Uh, in March of 2021, Kenyan inventors David Gathu and Moses, or Moses Kiuna uh, developed a robotic arm that can be controlled by brain waves, potentially revolutionizing the way people with disabilities interact with the world, which is very cool. In December of 2021, a team of researchers from the University of Technology, Sydney's Faculty of Engineering and IT, created a biosensor that clings to the skin of the face and head to detect electrical signals transmitted by the brain and translate them into commands to control autonomous robotic systems. Of course, all of these inventions worked with brainwaves and not plant signals. (laughs) Which is probably important. Uh, Bowen does not indicate whether his invention can be scaled up to work on humans, but the project does offer the promise that a robotic entity can be controlled autonomously by an external body. If anything, the invention highlights the many developments made in robotics edging ever closer to human-controlled machines that can serve as an extension of people 
what is the next step for his plant machete? Oh, I don't know. Putting it out in a goddamn field somewhere and letting them all take over. <laughs> That's how we're going to save the Amazon. We're just going to give yeah. all the rainforest arms with machetes. <laughs> <laughs> in the next movie, the rainforest <laughs> fights back. You don't want to go in that rainforest. Why? It's pretty sharp in there. It's like three <laughs> of the predator and, and the rest of the rainforest. Yep. Jesus, I tell you. <laughs> Some people you just, just see a are... bunch of lumberjacks fighting a tree with a machete and his chainsaw. <laughs> and winner gets to cut <laughs> the other one down. <laughs> well, boys, they say we can go in and take out this such section of forest as anytime we can. But, sir, these are 100 year old redwoods. No, son, they're 100 year old redwoods with a machete. <laughs> 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 Looks like we got a fight on our hands. Can you imagine how big that machete would be on a redwood? Oh, I know, right? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, let's move on. This is a horror movie come to life. It is. It yeah. is. It's like that, uh, what was it, Maximum Overdrive, where the everything that, like the cars and the vending machines and all that came to life. This is now plants arming themselves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's every vegan's wet dream. Uh, <laughs> no, because how are they going to get their food? Well, I mean, their you know, I, dream is pigs and cows learn how to shoot, and oh, that's also true, yeah. got a, it's, a riot on our hands. It's Wilbur with a machine gun. <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know. All right, let's move on. Let's move. All right, let's let's All move right. on from the murderous plants. There's a wonderful article out there. You can find it at uh, paranormaldailynews.com, uh, having to do with uh, Skinwalker Ranch and shaping humanity's future out there. I'm just going to hit some highlights here on this article. Uh, they sat down, actually, the, um, the article is written by uh, a lady by the name of Mary Kay Ranger, and uh, she's interviewing Brandon Fugel in it. And there's some interesting high points I want to hit here about what people know is Brandon Fugel owns Skinwalker Ranch. He's the yeah, private, yeah, yeah. the private investor that bought it. Yep. Uh, he bought it uh, essentially from uh, Mr. Bigelow. Yes. And they they point out a couple of things that I, I want to point out here. Um, they, they point out the coincidence that George Knapp has a connection with Skinwalker. The connection being that um, he has a connection to the individual who would eventually buy the property from the Shermans, that being uh, Mr. Bigelow. Uh, Knapp worked with the National Institute of Discovery Science, NIDS, which was founded by well-known Nevada billionaire, real estate developer, and owner of Bigelow Aerospace, Robert Bigelow, who uh, we mentioned a couple weeks ago, um, has put out some grants to prove that there's life after death, if you can scientifically prove that there's life after death. Right. Uh, he's also well known for his passion to discover an afterlife. Recently in 2021, he created the Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies and offered $1 million in prizes in a competition for essays for presenting the evidence for survival of human consciousness after bodily death. Better way of putting it than I put it. Uh, after the Sherman's claims were publicized in 1996, Bigelow immediately purchased the property from them for $200,000. That was it. Really? Ranch. That's a lot 000. of land for $200,000, too. That was it, my friend. $200,000. Apparently less than what they paid for it. That's how desperate the Shermans were wanting to get rid of it. Yeah, the Shermans, it, there's a lot of articles out there how much mm -hmm. how miserable they were on that ranch. And and they detail it here in this article as well. Again, uh, I'll put I'll put the uh, link for this in the description of the program, this article, so yeah. you guys can go and read it in depth. It's a, it's an interesting article. And if you're not familiar with the Shermans and stuff, they were just a, a family of ranchers mm -hmm. and they had they were the ones that started reporting all the strange going ons at the ranch and there's yep. there's newspaper articles there's magazine articles mm -hmm. there, i mean it was he was very the the dad was very open with the public about what goes on on that ranch yep uh the las vegas sun confirmed that the shermans moved to another property only 15 miles away and that terry sherman took a caretaker job on the ranch uh, this raises some questions. If the events they experienced were so frightening and disturbing, why didn't the Shermans move farther away than a mere 15 miles? 
Uh, why did Terry Sherman return to the ranch to accept employment from Bigelow as a caretaker? Uh, the year before purchasing the Sherman Ranch, Bigelow formed the National Institute for Discovery Sciences uh, to enable scientific research of the paranormal. The events reported by the Shermans caught Bigelow's attention. 21 years later, it would be revealed that those details also caught the attention of the U.S. government. I can answer the question of why he went back. Because if you watch the Skinwalker Ranch TV show, his, I want to say grandkids show up to the ranch. He kept journals and was trying to do his own research. And then he realized that he could still do this research as a caretaker, get paid to do it, and it's somebody else's problem. Ah, okay. So he, he they show up to the Skinwalker Ranch with all of his scientific studies, and they give over all of his research to the guys doing the research now. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's why. It wasn't – I mean, I can see why the conspiracy is there. So like, oh, he's doing it. He's making something up. No, he wanted to still study the ranch. He just wanted his family safe. Okay. Uh, the New York Times broke the story in 2017 with details about the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or AA TIP. Uh, it was formed in 2007, dissolved in 2012 after spending over $22 million in funding to study UFOs. According to Brandon Fugel, uh, Robert Bigelow became part of the program after former Senator Harry Reid and officials from the U.S. Defense Department visited the ranch. Uh, during Bigelow's 20 years of ownership, Bigelow invested massive resources into the research carried out by uh, NIDS or NIDSI. Uh, at some point, while Bigelow owned the ranch, he participated in discussions with Brandon Fugel. Fugel maintains that although the property was not for sale, this was just not another real estate deal. Bigelow was seeking a successor to its stewardship, and he chose Fugel. Perhaps Bigelow and Fugel bonded over their shared certainty of the existence of an afterlife. Under his company, Adamantium Real Estate LLC, Brandon Fugel anonymously purchased Skinwalker Ranch in 2016. Tell me you're a comic book fan without telling me you're a comic book yeah, fan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, they point that out in the article, too, that he, um, and it, it, in fact, I'm just about to read that here. Uh, they, they, they do a little background on Brandon Fugel. He's born in April 1st, 1973. Uh, he's a prominent businessman, chairman, co-owner of Collier's International in Utah, which is a top commercial real estate firm. He was previously named EY Entrepreneur of the Year. Fugel was raised by his parents uh, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Somewhere along the way, he became fascinated with science fiction. As you can tell, if you watch the show, uh, yep. you look at his office, it's got all kinds of sci-fi and, and, and comic book references. Uh, Adamantium pays homage to Marvel Comics. Uh, Adamantium is of, is, of course, the indestructible ally of which Wolverine's claws are made. So yep. there you go. And Adamantium and Vibranium are the two of the biggest things in the Marvel Universe. That's right. Uh, despite his keen interest in sci-fi, Fugel claims to have been a skeptic when he bought Skinwalker Ranch. However, his skepticism didn't stop him from reinforcing the existing security systems put in place by the previous owner. He installed additional cameras, motion detectors, and a 24-hour patrol. Uh, his reasons for elevated security include keeping people out for their own protection from unknown dangers. Fugel doesn't allow his own children to visit the property. He told Utah Business, I have four kids, but they have never been to the ranch. Uh, the danger is real, and we have to pr approach the ranch with a degree of reverence and caution. Fugel also put together his own multidisciplinary team of scientists, engineers, and military personnel to embark on the greatest science project of all time, he says in an episode of Jessup's Journal um, for ABC4 News. This team includes his friend, Bryant Dragon Arnold, installed as the chief of security for the ranch, who appears on the TV show. Uh, in a 2020 tweet, Fugel reveals that he met Arnold in 1992 while on a missionary assignment in Hawaii. Uh, soon, several team members began to experience strange occurrences. They reported acute medical episodes, electromagnetic anomalies, high levels of radiation, and equipment malfunctions. Tom Winterton, or Winteron, or Winteron, excuse me, uh, the ranch's maintenance superintendent suffered three unexplained serious head injuries. Uh, however, Fugel himself hadn't witnessed or experienced anything unusual, preserving 
his skepticism for the first six months of his ownership uh, of the ranch. Then in autumn of 2016, while outside with a group of others, Fugel witnessed his first UFO. He reported that it was a silver object, approximately 50 feet long, that hovered in the sky before disappearing with inexplicable propulsion movements. I can't unsee that, Fugel says. He became a believer, or as Fugel prefers, an experiencer. The event was not caught on any devices due to battery power drainage occurring in the hour prior, prior to the sighting. Uh, in an article in Newsweek, Fugel was quoted as saying, my perception of the world and universe has been forever changed by my experiences. Now, I believe the adventure of owning this paranormal property is just beginning. Following his purchase of the ranch, it was four years later that he admitted that he owned the ranch. Consequently, after that time, Fugel began negotiations with producers at the History Channel to create the new television series called The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch. In his own words, he stated, I owned the ranch for nearly four years before agreeing to go public in conjunction with the docuseries, allowing television cameras for the first time. Initially, he insisted on keeping his identity as the owner of the ranch anonymous for uh, fear that it might damage his business reputation. Fugel says that he also demanded that the show would only report the truth of the events at the ranch and that his own team would play themselves rather than a cast of actors. He also insisted on having the final cut on the content that would be broadcast. The wheels for the new show were set into motion and Fugel became a co-executive producer. Uh, he doesn't mention his company name, I don't think, till season two. You see him in season one, but not right away. He's always the owner is what they call him. And then he does show up, but they don't say his company until they start I think I think it was season two is when you find you finally see what company it is. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, let's see here. Let's skip along a little bit here. Uh, it mentions a little bit about the show. There's stuff that you already know, but then the show is great. If anybody's curious about uh, Skinwalker Ranch, the show does a really good job, and and he he they don't hide anything. There's a lot of science talk. <laughs> a lot of science stuff. Oh, sure. They're trying to they're trying to debunk everything. Was the reason that I like it is if something happens, they try to figure out why. What's the natural cause for this to happen? What's interesting is is in this article they actually you know Brandon never talks about his religious beliefs on the show. No, he doesn't. But in nope. this article, he does. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, on this show, he doesn't. He never talks about his family. He doesn't. He, he's very impersonal. On the show, mm-hmm. it's more or less they need to get permission from him for stuff. Like the whole first season, it's about digging on the on the land because when you dig on the land, bad stuff happens, is what they say. Yeah. So they got to get his permission. Obviously, he owns the land, you know. And then the second season, you see his office and stuff like that because they're going over like some of the stuff they saw. But he very rarely gets personal. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the uh. In the article, it says, Growing up in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Brandon Fugel was raised to believe in the spirit world. He said, We lived before we came to earth, and we continue to live after we die, as stated on a Latter-day Saints website. When asked by Doug Jessup if he feels a conflict between his religious beliefs and his scientific endeavors at Skinwalker Ranch, he asserts that there isn't a conflict and that purchasing the ranch is in alignment with his faith. Uh, with the perspective that religion and science are complementary, Fugel and his ranch may hold the key to proving the existence of other dimensions. Even after the late Stan Lee of Marvel Comics popularized the concept of a multiverse consisting of thousands of separate universes, Christianity and other religions already supported the existence of another dimension, the spirit world. If there's one, perhaps there are more. Uh, His quote here is, my goal with Skinwalker Ranch is to bring together a multidisciplinary group of people for the purpose of using science and technology in order to prove that we are not alone in the universe and that there is more to our existence that meets the eye. Uh, That, uh, Brandon said in an interview with Joe Mergia of UFO Joe, uh, Fugel admits that he is compelled to find hard evidence of a multidimensional universe He also told UFO Joe that he is considering expanding his investigations to the study of consciousness. Uh, Such studies would reach beyond the materialist view of humans while adhering to the third-person perspective of scientific pursuit. 
if Hugel can show empirically that other dimensions exist, then it follows that one of the, those dimensions could be the spirit world. It could also lead to the substantive proof that an afterlife or of an afterlife and the presence of angels among us. Uh, Fugel's goal is to have data to confirm that we are not alone in the universe and that we are part of an intelligent design. His research findings may unlock unlimited possibilities for the future of mankind and accelerate the evolution of theology. In a time when we are experiencing divisiveness amongst ourselves, Fugel's research has the potential to unite us as one race, the human race, and restore our faith, hope, and love for one another. This is according to the, the person who writes the article. Um, there's a... Uh, and then they say there's a correction here. A uh, previous version of the story was corrected with information gained directly from Brandon. Uh, okay. Um, but interesting article. And, and it's an interesting article in general about Brandon and Skinwalker Ranch and the history of the ranch. Um, I didn't know he was so hands-on with everything. Like, he looks like oh, yeah. he really wants the truth to get out there. Yeah. And, and you know, what's interesting. Having the final cut, then obviously that he probably needed the final say on that article. That's why there was a correction mm -hmm. made. Mm-hmm. But it's, and that's cool. That's very good. You know, what's interesting is he's not only uh, he's just as hands on as Robert Bigelow was. And I think that's why Robert Bigelow handpicked him to yeah. take over uh, uh, Skinwalker. Um, and I think I, I do think and, and without saying it, and I don't think it needs to be said, I think Robert Bigelow still has his hands very much on Skinwalker. I think he works hand in hand with Brandon. I'm sure he does. Yeah. That, that was a very passionate project for him. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure he does. Yeah. He might not 100% fund it, but he, you know, he's got something to do with it. I don't think it. there's any money there. I think it's more of a mentor role. Okay. Yeah. I think he, I think he just kind of guides Brandon along as to what happened when he was there. Uh, he consults him. He lets him know, of, you know, kind of says, hey, you know, when I was there, this is what happened. And I think he supplies him with experts who have been on the land and, and yeah. su supplies and him with people who may know a little more of what's going on and been there, been there, done that type of thing. And probably shares results with him. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, it's, it's totally Brandon's to run, own, and do with what he sees fit. Yeah. But I think Robert, Robert is just there to be a mentor. Okay. I wonder if he'll appear on the show. I'm sure that's a big surprise for a future future season. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think it. I think too it because they have the same goal. Brandon and, and Robert have the same goal. Right, they want to prove what's going on at the ranch, whether well, not it be only extraterrestrial. I think bigger than normal, dimensional, whatever they want to they want to prove it. Bigger than that, they both have the same goal of wanting to prove that there's life beyond what we see here. Yeah. 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 So I, I think eventually they they'll team up in that respect as well. I bet you they team up with the conscious thing because Brandon yeah. said in that article he's he's interested in doing it, and I'm pretty sure he's just letting Bigelow lay the groundwork before he, he yeah comes he, in there. he's letting him be the trailblazer. On it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Because Brandon's got enough to worry about with the the ranch. So right. Yeah. Uh, let's move on. Uh, interesting story about a young man who posted a video of a giant and then claims to be stalked by the CIA, and then he's mysteriously dead afterwards. Whoa, okay. Talk about layer upon layer upon layer of mystery. Yeah, this is a conspiracy theory ready to unfold. Uh, many UFO investigators fear that they and their works are being watched by governments, aliens, men in black, secret agencies, and even other investigators. Well, of uh, course they are. <laughs> no, well, you just take it for granted that they are. You know, I here's where you and I may, may part company on this issue. I don't think people are as closely watched as they think they are. I don't think they're as closely watched as they think they are, but I do think they're watched. I think if you get into that field, they, they're curious, and the more noise you make, the more they watch you. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know that I it's do. that tight. I do. With, with everything that goes on in this world, I don't think everybody can be followed all the time. That's what I'm saying. There's some that they check in on, if you will, and there's some they follow. And they, you know. Hmm. I don't know. But we'll you see. have to give yeah. them reason to follow in one of those categories. Okay. okay. And this kid obviously fell into one of those categories because he posted a video. Okay. 
Um, well, everybody's posting videos these days. So, I mean, you know, how do you, how do you break down the noise to figure out what's legit and what's just noise? Maybe they knew about this giant. Maybe they, they were like, Hey, this, this kid's putting proof out there stuff. We know that we don't want the public to know yet. Cause they can't handle it yet. You know, we need to do something about it. Do they, do I think they killed him? No, I don't think they're murdering people over it, but I don't, I don't think anyone's getting murdered over anything. I don't. Yeah. But I do yeah. think that they're, I, I, I think there is, I think, do I think there's a men in black? No. Do I think if you say you've been abducted or you had, an, you know, you, you saw a giant or whatever? No. But if you start making noise, you know, creating, creating waves in the pool, the lifeguard, whatever it is, CIA, government, whatever, does pay attention. Well, let's jump into the story and find out what exactly happened here. We'll, right, we'll right. cast our aspersions after that. Uh, there have been stories since the early days of ufology of mysterious visitors, threats, and even unexplained deaths. Those fears are now crossing over into other realms of the paranormal, cryptozoology, spiritualism, and other fields of the anomalous. The mysterious and unexpected death of a young man who posted a video of what appeared to be a giant, then reported being stalked and threatened by an unidentifiable forces, uh, then seemingly admitting it was a hoax, has many scratching their heads closing their drapes and wondering if they could be next. What exactly did Andrew Dawson see, and was it related to his mysterious death? Well, let's read on and find out. On April 4th, 2022, Andrew Ryan Watchorn Dawson posted a video on TikTok of what he described as a giant walking across the top of Whistler's Peak Mountain in Alberta, Canada. The Whistler's is an 8,100-foot mountain summit located in Jasper Jasper National Par in Dawson. Uh, or, I'm sorry, ja, Jasper National Par is wh- where, where it's located. And Dawson, I should take a breath there, claimed he and a colleague were driving to work on their regular route. They rode alongside the mountain when he saw something unusually large apparently standing on or walking across a peak. For those who wonder... If the apparition was whistling, the whistlers are named for their hoary marmot, uh, a species of ground squirrel native to the area, which emits high pitched warnings to other marmots for, of impending danger, which has given them the unfortunate nickname Whistler Pigs. <laughs> I like that name. Yeah. It sounds like a minor league baseball team. Or now ho- coming to your town, the Whistler Pigs. Or a hockey team, the Whistler Pigs. Yeah. 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 Uh, Media reports on the unusual TikTok video say Dawson's colleagues uh, did not see the figure and asked him what he was looking at, which seems odd since Dawson was able to record it. But it could be that the colleague was driving. Uh, Nonetheless, Dawson uploaded it and reports show the comments are turned off, that the video quickly had more than 2 million views and many comments. As a result, it appears Dawson became intrigued by what he had seen and began to show it beyond TikTok, hoping to find someone would explain or could explain what he recorded. Creating waves. TikTok waves. Uh, There's a difference. He went beyond TikTok. You just said it. Videos posted days later on TikTok show he returned to the location again to search for the mysterious giant and demonstrate how far away the peak was to illustrate how large the being must be. At one point, he says he thinks the creature was a Bigfoot. Unfortunately, Dawson did not see the being again and speculated that it comes and goes. He eventually asked for help, sponsors, a helicopter, someone with better equipment to magnify the video, etc. For most people, that might be the end of the story. However, Dawson would not give up and return to the area again. See, causing waves. (laughs) Let me finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is when it appears that someone who didn't want him around found him. I just got stopped by some CIA agent, told me to go back, said I was was trespassing. Well, he might have been. He might have been at a national park. Yeah, why why would the CIA CIA be in control of that, not the government? Because it's Canada, isn't it? Well, it's Canada, but again, the CIA. So wouldn't it be a Mountie or something? Oh, hey. Get off this lander, eh? Yeah, but there might be some American interest in that area. 
See, creating waves. They took notice because he started causing waves. Again, there might be an American <laughs> interest or post in that area, so a CIA agent might be approaching him and saying, hey, you got to get out of here. Why was there no CIA before this? Because they were driving on a road, and he filmed. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay. On April 12th, Dawson posted a video in re recounting an encounter at the Whistler's with a person he referred to as a CIA agent. Since he offers no proof that this person was indeed a government agent, this sounds on the surface like Dawson was frustrated about someone harassing him in a public park. He said he planned to go back the following day and record any encounters, noting that he was also curious why the road into the area was blocked off. The road to the area was blocked off. But he was on that road before when he filmed the original film. Why no, weren't no, no, they no. shut down then? The road to the road into the park was blocked off. Okay. Again, they weren't on the road into the park. They were driving by the park. Okay, so if you're if you're if there's something going on and I'm going to a national park and they say it's closed, they usually tell you why it's closed. They don't just say turn around and go home. Did, well, it depends. <laughs> no, no, no. It depends. I mean, literally, it depends on on what's going on that day. Yeah, they might say, "Oh, we're 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 testing this here this today, so you can't." Well, do that. not if it's a matter of national security. They're not going to tell I, you. They will still make something up. It'll be stupid, but they'll make something no, up. Oh, they're they're testing just... a forest fire seminar. Mm, you, you know, no. Oh, uh, the they'll, Mounties are you are would learning. See the fire. Some people it, ask too many questions, so you just I, you got to turn around. That, but that that's why they make it simple. Like if you ever kicked out of some place, they'll tell you why you can't be there. Would they tell I, you? I don't know. Now, is it CIA? I don't know if it's CIA. I I'll don't give know, you a perfect but, example of when you will be told, you, you when you will be not be told you need to turn around. Go up to the gate at Area 51 sometime. But that's, that's different. That's a well-known, with history, this is a one-time thing that he saw something. Mm -hmm. Went back to it numerous times. Walk up to a crime scene that's got yellow tape. And they try will to tell walk you, in. you're not allowed here. A crime occurred. They they might not say what crime, but they'll say a crime occurred. They'll say you That's can't be here. You got to turn around. Yeah, because a crime occurred. And then you try to ask what happened. They'll say it doesn't matter. Turn around. Well, exactly. And this guy, when he showed up, they didn't give him a reason why he had to turn around. They said, exactly. you can't be here. Turn around. They're not going to give you a reason. <laughs> it's none no, of your business. Normally they, normally they do. No, 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 they don't. The not park if it's, ranger go, oh, loose bear, you got to turn around. But it's okay. not a park ranger. If this is a CIA, a CIA agent, it's top secret. They're See, not so, gonna, then, then, so then you are agreeing with me that the CIA, he made enough waves, the CIA is checking on him. No, he's not, che not necessarily <laughs> checking on him. He's just telling him to turn around and leave. Because he's checking on that area where this video happened. No. So this guy's making waves. So they're following this guy. There could be there could going. be anything going on there. It could be that they have a but they have a this base. This guy, there. this guy's video brought attention to that area. Now they have no. To I'm not even place. saying that. I'm just saying that. No, no, that's what I'm saying. That's if you make enough waves, I think I you're they haven't monitoring you're everybody. See now you're you're getting riled up. Um, <laughs> You're on a rant right now. You're putting. I'm not. I'm not you're ranting. Put, you're putting one and to, one together, and you're getting three. I'm not. No. I'm, All I'm, I'm saying is this, and I'm reading directly from the story. Okay, <laughs> directly yes. from the story. This kid just decides to go up there, and he sees a CIA agent, and the road is blocked off. Right. So he just decides to take a trip up there, and it's blocked off. But he had already been up there two more times before that. Where does it say that? Didn't it say he went, well, the first video, with the video as he's passing, he took the video. Didn't he say go back one other time, and then this is the time he went back, and they wouldn't let him on the land? Now you're going to make me go back and read this again. We're wasting everybody's time. <laughs> Look at you. You're, ma you're making All, me stop for the class. My original statement was, my original statement was that you did not agree with, is I said they pay attention to everybody. It's just who they, they only track the people that make waves. This kid made waves with this video, so therefore they follow him and tell him he's not allowed to do that. I don't call being on TikTok and getting 2 million views making waves.
but he also he had also said on there too after the TikTok blew up, he went to other avenues to share the video. See, I see kids making, and I shouldn't say kids, I see people making waves with political videos all the time. And, nobody's and I'm sure shutting, there's a part of the government that handles that. Nobody's shutting them down. Oh, you know, because it's a public forum. Okay. There's stuff that's, there's so stuff you just that's said shut it. down. There's stuff that's shut down on TikTok. I could show you a guy right now who's reporting on major stuff going on as far as Russia and Ukraine goes. No one shut right. him down. He's been doing it for months. Okay. The kid works at Burger King. <laughs> He literally bruiser. He works at Burger King, but okay. he gets he gets these things a week, two weeks before. How does a kid at Burger King get get major news? And I'm sure he's on a watch list. Nobody's shutting him down. True, because he's not doing anything to put national security at risk or something that we know at risk. How is he not? He reported on troop movements. He reported on the of U.S. Our troop. Yeah, uh, yes, United <laughs> Nations troop movements, and he reported on 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 us giving giving the Ukrainians weapons. Maybe he's like I said. Maybe he's on their watch list, but he's not crossing that line yet where they need to step in. Keep an eye on that kid. I bet you if he reports the wrong story, he's gonna. He disappear. already. He already has. He's already said the U.S. gave Ukraine weapons. How is it that, that the FBI hasn't shown up at Burger King and taken this kid to a gulag? How, how do we know that the FBI hasn't showed up, said, where'd you get your information, and then went and found whoever was supplying them with the information? Bigger then, fish. then he wouldn't still be reporting. True, true. See? Let's, let's just agree to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Let me continue reading this story. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I, I understand where you, you're coming from, but... I just, I firmly believe... There are a lot of guys and gals on TikTok reporting a lot of stuff, and they're hitting on all cylinders, but nobody's coming for them. That we know of. That, that's public knowledge. Bruiser, nobody's coming <laughs> for him. I still think he's being watched by somebody and he's, he just hasn't crossed that line yet where this kid put this video out and it crossed the line. It was fine on the TikTok, but when he started sharing it to other platforms, like, has this kid been sharing it on other platforms or is it just TikTok? I don't You're Ukrainian. Where, where does it say he shared? To, well, it did say he shared it to. I thought it said something about him sharing on other platforms. That's what the I, video. Yeah, but it it didn't say it that it did any anything huge on other platforms. It just it's said just that, that it, it's it just there, said that I it think. it just said that it took off on TikTok. It didn't say that it took off on other platforms. It just that it but, was shared on other platforms. Right. So it so, so it could, could have taken off like because you, you can share a TikTok video on on Twitter. Yeah, I think you're 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 expanding. And it can go viral on there. Let, oh wait, wait, time out, time out, time out. <laughs> I think you're taking this in places that it it doesn't necessarily go. Like you said, well, it got shared on other platforms. It could have went huge on other platforms. It just said it got shared on other platforms. It didn't right. say it did gangbuster numbers in other places. True. If it would have done gangbuster numbers in other places, yeah, okay, I could see I could see somebody coming for him. Okay, well, but then how do you explain? Say, it doesn't. How say, do you explain the CIA being at that particular point in time? A number of reasons. You don't think they're there for him? You think that no. it was uh, nope. they were doing a drill or they were doing some CIA Could stuff have been on anything. that land Could that's have been. top secret they don't know about, and he just happened coincidentally to show up on the same day? We had we've had the FBI here in Minneapolis running in 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 running drills in Minneapolis. Oh. No, I know all that. Especially after years. 9-11, they were doing drills everywhere. Exactly. I know that, and, and they do they do them here in Minneapolis. So you Every think it's just a happy months. coincidence? A happy coincidence. And yeah, I have to disagree. The CIA runs runs drills with other countries. Oh, I, I know. I they, understand. And they but do I, trainings. I think it's too... And they do. But now, hear me out here. Yeah. They train with other countries. They train. They train other countries in different. Their military in different things. They do cooperative trainings. Um, they're, they run missions in other countries looking for different gangs, drug dealers. Um, th there are 
There are a multitude of things that they do. They could have been in this park for any reason or closed off this park for any reason. I just, I don't think it's a happy coincidence. I think he brought them there. That well, we got, let's find out what happened to him. How about that? We don't know the. We only know. As that's far what I've as been trying video. to say. <laughs> <laughs> let's find out what happened to him. But I think okay, you think no, I think yes. Let's read on and we'll find out. <laughs> I gotta find out where I was in this story. <laughs> All right. I bet you our audience is split 50-50. Some see my side, some see your side. I think our audience is frustrated because I can't finish the story is what I think. Okay, <laughs> let me finish. So CIA agent turns them around. Get out of here. That's where you were at. Okay, April 12th, Dawson posted a video in recounting an encounter at the Whistlers with a person he referred to as a CIA agent. Since he offers no proof that this person was indeed a government agent, this sounds on the surface like Dawson was frustrated about someone harassing him in a public park. So he had no proof that this person was a CIA agent. He okay. said he planned to go back the following day and record any encounters, noting that he was also curious why the road to the area was blocked off. Uh, did the thing on the mountain go home? This is the question for the next part of the story. Uh, Dawson returned on April 13th at 5.30 a.m. with his dog. It doesn't appear he encountered the CIA agent nor the being, but a video taken as the sun begins to rise shows what looks like a passenger jet in the sky, but he implies is a UFO by playing the theme music to the (laughs) (laughs) X-Files. Okay, that could just be a normal airline flying overhead. Yeah. Just a coincidence. Let, that, me, let, me, let, me a coincidence. Con- let me continue. A little while later, he records helicopters and his trucks go by, comments that they are extracting something. Again, that doesn't seem to be too unusual in these mountain areas. We continue. Participating in this activity could result in you or others getting hurt. This is just a, a, a subheader. Uh, returning in the dark on the following day, he is stopped by someone blocking the road and issued a warning. The next TikTok video was uploaded on April 17th and labeled being stalked because Dawson appears to see a car in front of his home, which when he goes out to confront the drivers, peels away at a high speed. No other videos are uploaded until May 6th when Dawson posts one titled official update. Uh, When he seemed to admit that the prior videos were all faked and he was sorry to disappoint you guys. In typical career video style, he appears to be nervous, looking away from the camera, possibly at someone else in the room with him. One thing very eerie about this video, he opens it by saying, I'm not dead. <laughs> okay. Um, There's two ways I could take that. One, yes, he's being stalked, all that, yada, yada, yada. The other is he just wants to get more likes so he knows there's enough conspiracy theorists out there. That if he says this BS thing and is looking all nervous and off screen, the conspiracy theorists will jump in and go, hey, he's being made to make this video. Yeah. So that, that's the two options we have here. On May 16th, Dawson posts a video titled, I am I am scared, where he is walking quickly in the dark. On the following day, he uploads video of equipment on the Whistler's Peak where he saw the being. He asks, what is that? That was not there yesterday. That video labeled military was the last video Dawson uploaded to at Andy capped. So it's a N D Y K a P T at this point, one could look at this as a typical attention getting series of TikTok videos. And they certainly did get attention in the millions of views that they attracted and the paranormal media coverage that followed them. That would be the end and time to move on, except for a news item that posted in the Campbell River Mirror on July 1st of 2022 in the obituaries, which was Andrew Ryan, Watchorn Dawson, November 4th, 1987 to July 1st of 2022 in loving memory. The photo accompanying the family memorial looks the same. It looks like the same Andrew Dawson in the TikTok videos. The comments on the obituary made note of the videos. Such sad news and his TikTok vids are compelling. It looks like real footage he captured on a men in black operation on that mountain. Others need to follow up his expose like local media should look into it. Uh, The videos he posted make me wonder what happened. How do you post things like that and just die? 
Is he dead because of his posts? Was he murdered? I have so many questions. Rest in peace. Uh, a search of Dawson's videos show no others referencing Bigfoot, UFOs, the CIA, conspiracy theories, or the like. Yet some posts on YouTube and other internet sites suggest otherwise, like this one. Mysterious video on TikTok gets Andrew Dawson murdered by government agent. Bigfoot, Yeti, Giant, CGI. Uh, it is indeed sad that a young man has passed away. If it was under suspicion or suspicious circumstances, let us hope that his death and events leading up to it are investigated properly and revealed to the public, and especially those investigating UFOs, cryptids, government agencies, conspiracies, and other anomalies so many people believe are being covered up. Now, go ahead. Well, did they never say how he died. So Exactly. That's the thing. Everyone just assumed he was murdered. How do we know he didn't commit suicide? How do we know he didn't have some sort of mental disorder? Exactly. How do we know it wasn't a car accident? Like, I need more information before I can say, yes, I believe this kid. But I still believe they keep an eye on that stuff and they track. His stuff happened to be coincidental. Or circumstantial. It's all circumstantial. Yes. Yeah. And, and it, it is sad. And this is what's wrong with a lot of reporting nowadays is they don't investigate. They assume. Do the investigation, contact someone, see how he passed away. Was it murder? Was it a car accident? Was it suicide? Was it he was trying to take a selfie on the cliff and fell off? You know, like, what, what did he pass away from? Well, and here's the other thing. Okay, so. And was it him? Because there still was no confirmation it was him. There was all the internet well, saying, oh, this looks like this kid. The obituary was placed by his family. Okay. So he did die, yeah. supposedly. So, yeah. Well, how do we know he didn't put the death, that notice well, out? Well, we don't. We don't know that he didn't, you know, that, that it wasn't him that put the death notice out. Right. But, but here's the... Here's the $50,000 question. If he was truly being persecuted by the CIA, how come he didn't tell somebody in private or tell somebody in confidence and provide them with a fail safe? Like, here's the stuff that I've taped. You know, here's a copy yeah. of what I've taped. Here's or keep a journal. Yeah. Or keep some sort of something in confidence with someone else in case in case I'm killed. Here's all my stuff. Maybe he didn't have time. It all happened within, a, I mean, from April to July. That's, yeah. I mean, that's a short amount of time, but it's enough time. Yeah. Or he could have tried and the person that he trusted the most said no. Oh, you're crazy. That's just your, you know. Your, your bipolar thoughts. Like, we don't know his mental state. There's not enough on him as he, person. Like, they need to do interviews with his family and to find out how he was personally. Even if I thought somebody was off, was off. We'll put it that way. Even if I thought somebody was hallucinating, I would still take their information in case something happened to him. I would, too. But... If you factor in the government situation, whoever we want to, I, I don't know. There, there's so there's so many questions that need to be answered before we can come up with a final. This is what it is. Yeah, yeah. I just I, I find it. And how how about this? How how do we know he didn't give it to somebody and he said, "Hey, if I pass away, wait X amount of time before releasing this." Yeah, because that's happened before. Yeah. I don't, or here's a third part of it. How how do we not know the CIA or whoever killed him found out where his scapegoat was and went and took care of that too? Nah, that's stretching. That that's stretching, but it's mm -hmm. still an option. I think there's so many holes in the story that it's just to me it's not plausible. I, I agree that there's holes in the story, but I still think that the Government takes a look, and if someone starts creating waves, they pay more attention to them. So I think at one point in time, yes, this kid created enough waves where they maybe paid attention to him. Did they kill him? Did they stalk him? No. 
them shutting down the park, like you said, it could have been anything, but it also could have been they were cleaning up whatever it was that was there. We don't know. We never will know. My statement, though, is yes, the 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 government does keep an eye on on people that make waves within that community. I'm trying to find my man on TikTok here, <laughs> who uh, who uh, again. He's coming up with secrets from uh, Burger King. <laughs> and I'm telling you, if he's still there. Are they confirmed? Just, all those secrets that he's talking about. I'm telling you, he's the, he's the kid who, I mean, he's, he's cracking news but stories it's, it's left and like right. It can be confirmed that what he says has happened. Yes. Okay. I, I will give you, exa- I'll sit here and read you examples. Oh, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. I just, I think he's being watched up. And I think if we actively get involved in the war, he will all of a sudden, all of a sudden stop. Because right now we're not actively in the war. We don't have boots on the ground. We're not, you know, I, one way or another. I'm telling you that I, I, this is why, it, and it's it's examples like this kid that that I just I just I don't. I'm telling you, I I know for a fact you can't keep your eyes on everybody. No, I okay. True. But like I said, I think there's levels to it. And this kid's at a certain level. The other kid was at a certain level. You know what I mean? So there's levels of how much interest they put into it. That's what I think. Here it is. His name is Javante the Reporter. Okay. And he's still reporting. There he is. He's he's still got he's still he's still reporting, man. I don't. I just I think he's on a certain level. I think if if something changes with America's involvement in that war, he will stop. They will put a stop to him. I mean, my man is still working at Burger King, working at Burger King, <laughs> and digging up news. And let me let me go back. Let me go back into. He doesn't give his sources for those news either, does he? Oh no, he gives them. He does. Okay. Yeah, yeah. he'll rip them right from the headlines, and and and. So it's public knowledge. No, not necessarily. It, you said rip from the headlines. He'll he'll rip them from different headlines, and then he'll he rips some stuff from headlines, but then he'll give you the source. He'll report it, and then he'll go and he'll. He'll back up what he's learned with a headline days later. So he'll say, hey, word is this is going to happen. And then he'll post a video a couple days later. Remember when I told you this is going to happen? Here's the headline. And it's like, damn. I think he's being watched. I think he's being watched. So, like, um, let me give you uh, let me give you an example. So... Uh, So he said, um, I got to make sure I got my volume down on my phone here. So let's see, when is this one dated? This one was dated August 21st. So there's a, an actual article, British soldiers told to get ready for war against Russia and prepare loved ones. Warrant officer Paul Carney said soldiers should prepare their families for the possibility of being sent to Ukraine to fight Russia in the war, which... Um, and then he's got another, he's talking in the background, but he says China picks aggressive new naval commander for Taiwan Strait. So he's talking about different military actions that are coming up. And he said, I keep telling y'all, this is coming. This is coming. Putin warns Macron of risk of catastrophe at uh, Ukraine nuclear site. So he's talking about different things that are coming up and he's citing these different articles. He said, I told y'all this was coming up, you know, at this this time, this time. So so my here, so far all of you said is about foreign countries being involved. If he starts reporting on actual US soldiers going there and joining the war and all that, then I think they, they pay attention. No, but then he ties it into US events as well. 
Yeah, well, yeah, but that, into the US. I, don't, I still think he's on a list. I still think he's being watched. He just hasn't crossed that line yet. And we don't know. He might not be as paranoid as this other guy where there are CIA agents watching this kid. But he's so happy making Whoppers, he doesn't notice the guy in the car across the street. <laughs> this is his passion, dude. This is what he loves doing. <laughs> I don't think he loves making Whoppers. I know that, but he might be so busy he doesn't notice the CIA guy across the street or the FBI agent. I just don't... And, and they haven't made contact with him yet, but they still have him surveilled. You can surveil somebody without them knowing it. it happens all the time. You know, when someone's that brilliant, though, I swear to you, I don't think they, I don't think they watch him. I think they go hire him. Oh, I, I agree with that. I that I one hundred percent agree with. Yes, that that is one hundred. You always hear about it all the time. Uh, that guy that the movie Catch Me If You Can is based on. Once they caught him, the first thing they did was give him a job. You know, and then all these hackers that get caught hacking stuff, they give him jobs. So yeah, I agree with that. But I still think that they're watching him. So if this kid was so brilliant and was able to figure out that Bigfoot's on the top of this mountain, why would they kill him? How do we know he's dead? How do we know that wasn't a ploy? Now he's undercover somewhere. How do we know that he didn't just kill himself? How do we know he didn't kill himself or get into an accident before he could start that job? We don't know. That's what I'm saying. With him, we have to find out his cause of death. But see, that's the everything. thing. They wouldn't make him fake his death just to take a simple job to go figure out where Bigfoot is. True. Very true. So that, that's so why he could have nothing... died. He could have died going to Burger King to talk to your guy and got into a car accident. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that's why you're stretching. Every, everybody's stretching on this deal. That's what I'm saying. You know, so, yeah. like he could have. He could have passed. We don't know how he died, so we don't know if the CIA was involved in it. I don't think they were, but I, I think he just died somehow. <laughs> I. I, I, again, stand by my original statement was, I think they're paying attention to everybody. If you create waves, they pay more attention to you. Sure. <laughs> sure. We got to, we got to move on. We got a couple of stories and then we're done today. I know I already got you riled up. I'm going to get you riled up more. <laughs> we haven't even done our parisher yet today. Look at, you've been going off about me. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> I am. Doesn't bother me about a kid who, doesn't bother me either. It's just that you don't think that the CIA is watching everybody. I don't think they are. I do. I don't think they have time. I do. I think they're too busy uh, getting high with bubbles of chimp from the right. <laughs> they're getting high on meth with bubbles of chimp and having a good time. So I think. <laughs> All right. Yep. And listening to uh, old Michael Jackson records. <laughs> That's what they're doing. They don't have time for that stuff. Which I just picked up Thriller the other day. Found a really good record store. You finally finally found a copy? Is that the deal? No, no, I'm on vinyl. I collect vinyl now. Mrs. Bruiser and I have a small collection. Oh, look at that. Yeah. We found a really good record shop right up the road. Finally got around to vinyl, did you? (laughs) We always have been, but (laughs) did you know that record players are super expensive nowadays? I remember back when I was a kid, you could buy them for cheap, but then all of a sudden everybody wants to start collecting vinyl again. That's right. That's how they get you. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's totally you can Bluetooth it too. So if I want to play MP3s on it, I could. Isn't that screwed up? You can you can play your MP3s on your on your record players. <laughs> that is so messed up. Let me see here. Parachute. Nothing parachute. beats the sound of vinyl though. That is a, it's a unique sound. It is. That it is. Yeah. That it is. Uh, let's see here. Oh, 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 let's do some parachute. Let's do some parachute here, shall we? Yes. Um, I got an interesting, you know, we were talking about, uh, as Matt, Matt, our buddy, uh, put it, he said, uh, we're, he called it death wishes. Uh, it's not death, but what we wish for at our funeral. Um, we were talking about that the other week. And you remember we were talking about how we'd like to play that joke where we uh, we had the uh, we had the the wife from another family show up with kids. Yep, yep, yep. And how that'd be funny. He says, "Hi, Tim Bruiser. Just listened to what you'd want at your funeral and had to laugh when you said you wanted two wives to show up. My wife's 
co-worker's father passed away and another woman showed up with kids in between her and her siblings' ages. Apparently, he had another family where he used to travel for work. She had no idea, but the other family knew about his wife and kids. What a surprise for them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, he literally, uh, you know, went out for... It really uh, can happen. <laughs> he went out one night for cigarettes and had another family 11 miles down the road, as Dave Chappelle used to say. Wow. He says, thanks for the info and laughs, Matt. I actually wrote him back and said, can I actually use this on the show? He said, absolutely. Yeah, that is that is amazing. He said, uh, he still said, it's still unbelievable. There were no fireworks at the funeral. Her whole family was in a state of shock that there were three brothers and sisters. And like I said, in between their ages, they had no idea that he had two lives. Nobody knew. That he had to be exhausted 100% of the time. <laughs> I don't know. He's two wives, fun? two families, like just hiding it for so long from the one family. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Matt, on that. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. That that's great. That's hey, great. look, so it's not really a practical joke anymore, Tim. <laughs> it can really happen. <laughs> well, I, you know, not on this end. I'd, I'd have a shotgun in my face. Oh yeah, I couldn't do that. No, Mrs. Bruiser would. She'd somehow figure out how to reincarnate me just to kill me again. <laughs> <laughs> She'd dig you up and dig you up and kill you all over again. Yeah. Here's the other pair of shirt we have this week. Hi, cruiser or hi oh, cruiser and bruiser. I uh, hope this message finds you both doing well. It's your pal Amanda with another dream pair of share for you. I must warn you, this story gets dark. It might be triggering for some. Okay, so beware here, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, my childhood friend Mike was a classic neighborhood kid of the 90s. He was a jokester in the same grade as my older brother, and they became best friends in elementary school. Growing up, he was a staple in many of my core memories, as often as my brother's partner in crime, whether teasing me as the annoying little sister or as I got older, one of my fiercest protectors. Mike spent a lot of time at our house, and I never thought much of it. Uh, later in life, I found out he, that he had problems at home and sometimes had to stay in a group home or in state care. Oh, that's sad. That is. Um, he had felt safe around my family, and our door was always open to him. I considered him my bonus brother. My brother and Mike went on to enlist in the Navy together straight out of high school, and our family proudly stood up for them both at graduation from boot camp. Life took its twists and turns after that, and everyone set out on their own paths. After leaving the Navy, unfortunately, Mike became a bit of a rolling stone, falling on hard times, moving frequently, and turning to substance abuse. I became a mom. We lost touch and didn't see him until my brother became a father a few years later. He was still the kind of friend you wanted to catch a break and see things work out for them in spite of their issues. That seemed to be the case. He cleaned up. He met a girl and was expecting a baby. Life's direction was looking up for him or so I had hoped. One late night in early December of 2013, I got a call from my brother, and his tone was shaking. Mike died. Mike is dead. My heart stopped. My hands went cold, and my voice broke. How? My brother answered. He was shot and proceeded to break down in tears. I was in disbelief. Our friend, along with his child and stepchild, had been killed by the father of his girlfriend who was the grandfather of the children. I have included the article at the end if you wish to read it off here. Okay, and I'll do that. Uh, we were shocked, devastated, gutted for him, for his girlfriend, for her family, for the children. I was flooded by so many emotions and questions, mostly asking why. How could someone or something so evil happen? How could he and those little ones uh, have been murdered? Uh, the grief I felt after learning of this tragedy accompanied me constantly for weeks. Less than a month later, uh, it was my brother's birthday. The night before, I found myself awake in a vivid dream. I was in a movie theater straight out of the vibrant 90s. Brightly colored neon lights on purple walls and a busy printed carpet cascading up steps from the ticket lobby. I reached the top of the steps leading to the brightly lit concession stands and standing right at the landing opening, I see, I, there I see him, Mike. I felt, a I felt a wave of shock through my body 
as our eyes locked, and he immediately broke into a side mouth shit eating grin he had always had whenever we ran into each other. I ran up to him and said, Mike, what are you doing here? You died. He shrugged off my question and smirked, saying, I know, don't worry about it. Just give me a hug and embrace me. He was solid. It was him. It was the shape of the hug I remembered feeling when he had graduated boot camp so many years ago. The dream ended there, and I woke up feeling the knot of unease loosened slightly after weeks. Remembering it was the morning of my brother's birthday, I called him right away. And here's where things got weird. When he answered groggily, I followed my urge to use my best Elmer Fudd voice, but not quite knowing why, I said in a monotone, Happy birthday, Mr. Twiggo. (laughs) Her last name is Trigo, and he started to laugh. My brother paused and said, why did you say that to me like that, Amanda? Crap, he didn't laugh. I knew he was serious because he used my entire name. I replied, I don't know, just messing around. Why are you mad? He explained that Mr. Twiggo was an inside nickname between him and Mike. Floored, I I recounted him my dream. After taking it all in, he went on to tell me the nickname stemmed from a joke formed between them many years ago. It originated from the way their sixth grade teacher would call on my brother in class. My brother couldn't stand it. That same year, they went on to our our local movie theater to celebrate my brother's birthday. Mrs. Doubtfire was playing, and I was not allowed to tag along and watch the older boys. Somewhere during this movie experience, the inside joke was born, the boys trying their best at voices, and I was never in on it or part of it. Mike would refer to my brother as Mr. Twiggo, uh throughout the years whenever he needed to snap him out of a heavy moment to make him laugh. My brother and I talked some more and concluded that this had to be Mike's way of wishing him happy birthday since his physical presence wasn't here to say it. Even in the afterlife, he still had a sense of humor. The connections were too great to be coincidence, and we both agreed that this was a visitation, not a dream. I mentioned in a previous parish here I'd had several paranormal experiences growing up And throughout my life, my brother witnessed several of them. He didn't question that his friend was messaging him through my or through me due to my sensitivity and fully believed I was channeling Mike, knowing that he is still or knowing that he is still be out there in the ethereal somewhere. Somehow being a smart ass has helped us heal us more than time ever could. Um, It's been nine years uh, since we lost Mike. And I've seen him twice more over the years during dream visitations. And I truly do believe that is where they are, visit or what they are, visitations. Uh, thank you for taking the time to read my story. I know it was a long one. My love to the chipmunks and to Ziggy Star Pup. Tim, I'm glad you're doing better after your recent health scare a few weeks ago. Take care and God bless, Manda. Well, thank you, Manda. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'll, I agree with her. I agree with her. I think it was visitation. I'll forward you the the email, Bruiser, so you can see the article at the end. So. Yeah, I'm curious about that. That's a interesting. I'm a true crime fan too, so it'll be interesting to read that article. Yeah, it's um, it's tragic. It is. It's uh, sad, but it's a uh, it's an interesting addendum to. It's sad, but it it's it's interesting how she's able to cope with it after that dream and, and that visitation. I agree with her. It's a visitation, especially since choosing the theater as a way to meet her, you know, knowing that that's where the name came from and everything. Yeah. Boy, Amanda, you sure have been through a lot there, girl. Yeah. Yeah. Strong, strong person. It sounds like very strong. My condolences, my condolences. Well, let's see if we can't cheer you up a little bit here, Amanda. Um, (laughs) the last two stories here, a bizarre MRI scan of an unborn baby looks like pickle Rick or Mr. Bean. (laughs) It is the ugliest baby you've ever seen. Uh, and it'll plain frighten you. If you see the pictures, I might put up the, uh, I might put up the picture in the description of the show here too. Uh, cause you might either want a good scare for Halloween or a good laugh. One or the other, uh, yeah, Reddit, those, those 3d ultrasounds are terrifying. Oh, I don't know horrible. if you've seen those. 
my youngest, they, that's when they first came around was when my youngest was in the womb. And, and I literally told the doctor, like, nope, go back to the original. I don't, nope. <laughs> I'd rather just see the outline, you know? Just yeah, yep. Make them look like an alien from Close Encounters, and that's fine. Yep. That's all I want. This yeah. is ter- I'd like, those just creep me out. <laughs> yeah. Reddit users were left amused and freaked out in equal measure recently by a weird MRI image of an unborn baby. Uh, most people will be familiar with what an ultrasound image of an unborn baby looks like, but there are few who have likely ever seen what an unborn baby looks like in an MRI scan. Uh, MRI or magnetic resonance imaging uses strong magnetic fields and radio waves to build up an image of the inside of the human body and can be very helpful if there is an issue with the pregnancy. All users on Reddit found out recently, however, that MRI scans of an unborn baby can look strange to say the least, (laughs) mainly due to the way uh, the eyes and brain stand out in the image if the baby is oriented a certain way. Uh, This particular image, which has already received tens of thousands of views on social media, shows a rather peculiar MRI image that is as unnerving as it is amusing. Uh, (laughs) You're... One user remarked, it looks like a cursed jelly baby. <laughs> well, another described the images as an eggplant shaped version of the aliens from Mars attacks. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Others still believe that the images looked like either Mr. Bean or Pickle Rick from Rick and Morty. I'm Pickle Rick. Pickle Rick. Uh, otherwise, uh, one expectant mother was quoted as saying, I'm pregnant and I can't stop laughing at these. (laughs) Suffice to say, you may never think of what a baby looks like in the womb in the same way ever again. You probably won't ever look at a a little baby in the womb and think, oh, that's so cute. This this baby just looks bizarre here. I'm going to try and turn this around and show this to you. Bruiser, this is not a good looking baby. Uh. (laughs) You know, right? Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it looks like it looks like a the wish version of the Iron Maiden. Yes, it looks mascot. like Eddie, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks like Eddie, but someone that doesn't have artistic skills drew it. Right. Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 Eddie in the womb, Eddie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They better name that child Eddie. <laughs> they better, yeah. And not after Eddie Van Halen, but Eddie after Eddie the Iron Maiden guy. Yeah, Eddie the Iron Maiden guy, Eddie. Yeah. Ugh. Ah. all right now finally uh here it's your turn to rant i play this only because this is your own personal nightmare (laughs) yes folks this story especially for the beer city bruiser a beer shortage is brewing (laughs) what yeah no yep a beer shortage. Okay, what kind of beer? <laughs> Every beer. No. On the planet. Why? Why? A volcano is partly to blame. Well, screw volcanoes. <laughs> well, I wouldn't screw one. It's too hot. It is. It's a Goldilocks thing. This one's too hot. This one's too cold. This one's just right. If you're ready for this, Bruiser. No, I don't want to hear about beers short. So I got to stock up in beers, is what you're telling me. You better, yeah. Beer and meat lovers might have a difficult time getting their favorite products this fall. That's right. Meat too? Meat too. You've been Beer and bacon are my life, man. <laughs> you've been meat tooed. Um, that's because there's a shortage of carbon dioxide or CO2 in the U.S., Everybody, quick, exhale. Let's keep exhaling. Let's <laughs> exhale till we save the beer. Hashtag exhale for beer. <laughs> Leading to complications at a number of breweries and food suppliers across the country. Food and beverage companies such as Tyson and Kraft Heinz have been scrambling to find suppliers of the gas. Which I will is- be more than happy to breathe into a bag to supply it to make beer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, CO2 is used for putting fizz into drinks and freezing frozen meats and pizzas. So pizzas are at, at, at risk here, too. They just want to shut down every bar in America, don't they? They do. Uh, some local breweries have even had to suspend operations at their facilities because of the shortage. 
Hashtag exhale beer. Exhale for beer. That could mean fewer jobs and higher beer prices. Oh. Time to make the Mrs. Bruiser get a second job. <laughs> <laughs> what is causing this carbon dioxide shortage, you may ask? Well, yes. a number of factors have led to the current situation, but maintenance shutdowns of CO2 plants and general summer demand for drinks are the most likely culprit, according to the Brewers Association, a U.S. trade group. While many of the specific issues in the market are new, CO2 has experienced various supply chain challenges since the beginning of the pandemic. The Brewers Association said in a statement, this is one of the many areas where small brewers are facing cost increases and availability issues. Some analysts have attributed the current tightness in part to contamination at the Jackson Dome carbon dioxide well, an extinct volcano in Mississippi. <laughs> Denbury Energy, the owner of the site, attempted to drill new CO2 wells to fill its industrial contracts, but the CO2 reportedly contained contaminants. I'm coming to Mississippi. Get all your bags ready. We're going to form an army. <laughs> we're going to we're going to exhale for beer. Let's do this. <laughs> Everyone, we're going to join hands, go to Mississippi and exhale for beer. This according to Gas World. I have no idea what Gas World is. I just love the fact that there's something out there called Gas World. <laughs> Sometimes they call that my restroom after I'm done in there. Well, it could be, yeah. Uh, Denbury said the contamination was a minor issue in a statement to time. I'm glad there's somebody being positive about the situation. Yeah, it's yeah. Minor I, I'm trying to figure out a solution. This guy's like, oh, it, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, the CO2 produced at Jackson Dome has been and is being produced within all regulatory requirements, and the composition of the delivered CO2 continues to meet contractual spe specifications. In other words, it's quality CO2. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Uh, we've been working with certain of our customers, such as food and beverage grade requirements, to address processing issues that existed in their distribution chains. Our customers are receiving all of the CO2 they are requesting. Driver shortages are further jamming up the supply of the gas, the Brewers Association says, particularly with local delivery. Uh, many of the sourcing challenges, it says, are worse in the southeast, but reports of CO2 shortages and quality issues have been reported across the U.S. since the middle of the summer. Oh, no. The Compressed Gas Association, <laughs> which is another <laughs> industry trade group in the U.S., does not expect to see any relief until at least this month when scheduled maintenance at CO2 industrial facilities are expected to be completed. Beer producers are being squeezed here, Bruiser. No, oh, no. That's what it says here. The beer industry has been hit particularly hard by the shortage, forcing some small breweries to consider raising their prices to offset rising costs and remain in business. Some are even experimenting with CO2 alternatives such as nitrogen. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that as long as beer keeps coming out. Have you ever, have you ever had the Pepsi with the nitrogen in it? No, but I've had the uh, Guinness that has the nitrogen in it. It's creamier, isn't it? Yep. Oh, yeah. I like it. I do too. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I like it. Uh, we're using CO2 constantly. Brian Vanden Erver, uh, owner of the Red Bear Brewing Company in Washington, D.C., tells Time, our supplier let us know that they weren't taking on any new clients. No, oh, no. Mm. But at some point, they may come to us and say they can't meet our needs, which is worrying because beer is our main product. That email that guy, tell him I'll come and breathe in a bag. He can save all my CO2. <laughs> I'm going to exhale for beer. Exhale for beer. Uh, there was a surcharge for all CO2 that our supplier just sent us recently. He added, when Night Shift Brewing in Everett, Massachusetts, learned that its CO2 supply had been cut for the foreseeable future, 12 employees were told their jobs may be cut as the brewery moved its production to a different source. Our plan had been to continue problem solving, but this latest CO2 issue has basically thrown a huge wrench into any of those plans, threatening even immediate production, Night Shift Brewing wrote in a uh, statement posted on Facebook in July. For craft breweries, extra CO2 is often added to the beer during the fermentation process in the tap room for pushing beer through lines to glasses. 
and when putting beer into cans. Van der Uver uh, says that if the shortage worsens, this brewing company uh, might have to use nitrogen in the fermentation tank instead of CO2. Though that's a worst-case scenario, nitro beer often has less carbonation, giving it a more smooth and creamy texture, meaning IPAs and Pilsners might have different flavors. Some larger breweries are able to capture the CO2 from their beer production and reuse it, but that's not an option for smaller brewing companies uh, since the equipment is expensive and can take up lots of space. The CO2 shortage isn't just impacting the beer industry. The gas is commonly used in almost everything we consume beyond creating the fizz and drinks. It helps rapidly chill food that can be frozen. Uh, carbon dioxide is even used to make dry ice, and it can be used for humanely slaughtering animals. Fresh meat could also be in shorter supply at local grocery stores. The Wall Street Journal reported that Tyson and Butterball were among the companies affected by the CO2 shortages. Uh, Cold cuts, which are preserved with CO2 and other gases, could also take a hit. Modified atmospheric packaging takes out the oxygen and pumps in CO2 to give products a longer shelf life. But companies like Kraft Heinz have warned retailers of a potential shortage of turkey and bologna uh, during the shortage. Kraft Heinz did not respond to a request for comment. Frozen foods such as vegetables and pizza also use CO2 for enhanced freezing and preservation to prevent prevent bacteria growth. For producers unable to find alternative sources, the next few months could be difficult. We're hoping the shortage is going to resolve, but it doesn't sound like that's going to happen at least through the fall. Van den uh, says, so that's just an ongoing thing that we're going to deal with. Well, we're not going to deal with it on football Sundays, I'll tell you that much. Fall is a great time for beer, too. It's when all the really good new beers come out. Like Yingling releases their Hershey Stout. It's so yeah. good. There's some pumpkin beers that I like that come out that are really good. Shock Top's got a really good one. So I'm putting it out there right now. Any breweries that need extra carbon dioxide, contact me through Twitter or my email. I'm, I'll am i come to you. I'll breathe into the vat. I'll do whatever I have to do to get you the carbon dioxide. There you go. Because we excel for beer. Hashtag exhale for beer. There you go. It's the, <laughs> we got to save the beer. We got it. It's the BCB brand of whatever whatever. You get a little bit got. of BCB with it. Yep, that's right. There you go. I'll make myself FDA approved. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you're going to do mouthwash before I do it. Fine, I'll do mouthwash. There you go. I, you know, I, you're taking this a lot better than I thought you would. I'm 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 trying to problem solve here, Tim. I can't panic right now. I've got to problem solve. Actually, we pan- got to fix the problem before it gets to the point where we don't have beer. Panicking will get more CO two out of you, though. Well, I'll panic in the brewery when they tell me, "Oh, you're not enough." I'll be like, "Oh, I will. I'm enough. Watch." And I will panic to get that <laughs> CO two. There's enough beer drinkers in, in this world where we can exhale for beer. There you go. Look at you. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying not to be panicking and worrying. I mean, this is my livelihood we're speaking of. <laughs> I, I hear you. I hear you. So that'll do it for today. Uh, now both Bruiser and I both have anxiety going into uh, tomorrow's <laughs> show. That's, 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 uh, that's pretty much the deal right there. Anxiety for everybody today. Yay. Yay, anxiety. Yay, anxiety. I'm trying to think of who we have on the show. Um. Oh my gosh! And then I go to I go to my Google Calendar to find out who we have on the show tomorrow, and I see an article about we might have a new trade partner for Alexander Madison for the Vikings. We need Madison. Cook is garbage. <laughs> <sighs> I can't focus yeah. on things like this. I just can't. My life yeah. is life is too short, Bruiser. Life is too short. It is. Enjoy it. <laughs> it's true. Who is on the show tomorrow? Let's see. Who am I? Oh, you know who is? Who? La Carmina. Ah. We're going to be talking about, uh, you know, people may be saying, Tim, you're talking a lot about Satanism lately. <laughs> you know, it's that time of year, though, if you think about it. It is. Everyone always incorporates Halloween and all that with Satanism. When it's not, it's a pagan r- ritual. It's a pagan and, thing. Yeah. Yeah. But people correlate that so it makes sense you're just going along the the theme of the spooky month 
the spooky month. That's, I like how you put that. Uh, yes, La Carmina will be with us tomorrow, and we are going to be talking about, I think she's from the Satanic Temple, if I remember right. Oh, you're going to talk about Satan Fest? Seeing how we can get a booth? <laughs> yes, I'm going to check into a booth for us. Uh, tell her I've got some interesting ideas. I think I know how we can change this whole thing up. We'll bring Dan Housen with us, you and I there. It'll be great. You It'll think he'll time. go? Do you, do you think he'll go? I'm sure if we pay him enough, he'll show up. <laughs> Damn, there's got to be human monies behind it. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what he does. You know that in a blimp. <laughs> speaking of, his dad contacted me last night. So I, okay. think, I think Brian Danhausen will be with us shortly. Nice. So we're going to talk. We're actually going to talk about his abilities. Yeah, he's got fantastic abilities. Yeah. From what you've told me. Yeah. So he'll be on a future show. Um, but uh, <laughs> but we can't get the sun huh? <laughs> to, to go with us to the Satanic Temple. Maybe. Get us on first. To do Satan Fest? Let's lay the groundwork with the bruiser and the cruiser, and then we'll start bringing in guests. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just thinking for like a festival deal, you know? And we'll bring Dan Housen. Yeah, we could. We'll book him in. We'll have the Satanic Temple pay him. We don't have to pay him. Exactly. That's how that'll work. We'll we'll have we'll have uh, we'll have the Satanic Temple pay him. That, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so yes, La Carmina tomorrow on the show, and we will talk about uh, some of the uh, the truths and myths of Satanism. Okay, we'll we'll talk. That'll be part of it, and uh, maybe we'll answer some of your questions. If you have any questions about uh, Satanism, hit me up. Tim at darknessradio dot com. Um, I can ask them of La Carmina tomorrow. Sounds good. I like yeah. the name. La Carmina. Yeah. She's, uh, I'll, I'll give her this. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a superficial guy. Yeah. She's pretty darn good looking. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll look her up. Yeah. I'll look her up. So, uh, yes, we'll be talking about that. And she has a new book out there as well. Uh, that answers a lot of those questions. So we'll be talking about the new book tomorrow as well. So. So that'll do it for uh, today. Uh, we've got lots of good stuff coming up in the month of October for Darkness Radio and for True Crime Tuesday. Um, Brian J. Cano is going to be joining us this month. He's oh, got nice. a, a new book about his life. Uh, we'll be talking about that. Um, True Crime Tuesday side, we've got... Uh, boy, we've got a new movie, a new crime movie that's out there uh, that Ryan Phillippe is in. That we're, really? Yeah. He's back, huh? Yeah. So we're going to be we're going to be talking about that towards the end of the month. Um on True Crime Tuesday, uh lots of stuff. Lots of good stuff on the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um I think uh one of the guys from Finding Bigfoot is going to join us this month on uh Darkness Radio. We're going to talk monsters this month. Um lots of good stuff. Yeah. Very yeah. exciting. Yeah, we got lots of good stuff in the hopper. So It's a spooky season. It's a spooky season, and I got a. I, it hit me out of the blue um, the other day. An idea for our Halloween show. Ah, okay. So we're gonna we're gonna gather a bunch of our friends, and we're going to ask them one question, which is, I don't know that I dare reveal it. Okay. Before, okay, we'll but wait. put it this way: Halloween is a season of haunts and haunting, right? Yes. Yes. Maybe yes, I should, it. should I reveal the question? No, no, let's let him. Okay. We'll, we'll just do a little we'll bit. We'll just say that Halloween is the season of haunts and haunting. Yes. And it has, the question has to do with haunts and haunting. Okay. We're going to ask a lot of our friends out there that we've had on the show um, that this question reveal, you know, and reveal a little something about their psyche. All right. And we're going to dig, dig a little deep with them. And we'll reveal it to you on that show. And, and we'll literally bring trick or treat to you because it's either going to be a treat, their answer, or it'll be a trick. Ah. <laughs> Put it that way. <laughs> so that's, that's, kind of the, uh, that's kind of what we have to look forward to for the Halloween show. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be fun. Yeah. So that's, that's what we're going to do. Uh, that'll do it for today's show. Again, La Carmina on tomorrow's show. We'll be talking about Satanism. And then uh, we'll continue on the month. We'll keep rolling along here on Darkness Radio. Keep the hits coming. That's right. Uh, where are you going to be this weekend, Bruiser? Uh, I'm doing a charity event on Saturday. Uh, I can actually tell you the name of this charity event. Um, 
it's for a good cause. It's called the uh, Stuff the Truck event. It's at Twin City Automotive, which is in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And uh, I don't know exactly what we're stuffing the truck with, but I know it helps people in need. So Okay. I will be there. Uh, I don't know if they're having matches or not, but I know he asked if he could advertise me. And I said, yeah, please. Anything to help yeah. the, the less fortunate. Good deal. Good deal. Um, I'll just be cursing at my television. I'm <laughs> not getting up early to watch the Packers. I am not no? doing that. No. You going you going to tape it and get up and watch it at a decent hour? I'll catch it on Sports Center. Really? Yeah, I'm I'm a fan, but I'm not that type of fan. Like I can just watch highlights and be okay. Okay. Plus Aaron Rodgers puss puss face is pissing me off. <laughs> I don't blame you. I I'm getting to that point with Kirk Cousins now. Yeah, I'm actually, like, I'm actually arguing with other Vikings fans who like him. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting on online and and just blasting the crap out of him. Yeah, I just I just don't like that if someone drops the ball, he gets a puss puss face. Like, dude, you're not perfect. No one else is perfect. Yeah, you know, he yeah. threw an interception for a touchdown. He had a puss puss face, and he was yelling at everybody else. Like, you're your fault, dude. You threw it. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So yep. I'm just you know I can go without his puss puss face. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. I'm just tired of uh, Kirk Cousins folding like a house of cards every time somebody breathes hard on him. You know, I mean, there's, there's, I know it's not sports talk, but hey, it's it, you know what? There was a PFF came out with um, came out with their rankings for the different players for Sunday for that game. Yeah, and only one lineman, as far as pass blocking, did horribly. Ezra Cleveland, and you know who he was blocking? Ooh. Cam Jordan, <laughs> who had a field day with him. Otherwise, yeah, the rest of the line had a great day. Yeah. So you know what that tells me? Okay, so Cam Jordan got to Kirk Cousins. Yeah, Cam Jordan's amazing, though. Yeah, exactly. He's all world. I don't um, even think he's hit his prime yet. No. Mm-mm. And. uh so that just tells me one thing. Kirk Cousins a wuss. <laughs> he is. Yeah. And he, and he scares easily. He does. Yep. So I don't take him yep. to war with me. That's what I know. And, you know, they, sh- they show one thing on Sunday that Kirk had to come over and he had to settle down his receivers because he, he had to come over and admit that, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, boys, I'm a wuss. I, I, first of all, I, I, I don't have any vision on the field. I can't tell you when you're open and when you're not. And I can only hit my primary receiver and my check down. Yep. So you're just going to have to deal with it. I don't know how to do my job. You have to run into my vision instead of me looking for you. That's right. Yeah. If you, if you just <laughs> run out in front of me, I'll be able to throw it to you. Otherwise, you're screwed. <laughs> Dumbass. Anyway, so that'll do it for the best in paranormal talk radio. <laughs> That's hypocritical, isn't it? Anyway, and, and we'll figure out what happened to the giant the giant guy someday. <laughs> I'm sure he was probably killed by a sports talk guy. <laughs> sports talk CIA guy who yeah. got pissed off at Aaron Rodgers and Kirk Cousins. <laughs> that's probably what happened. See, I, I brought it full circle. No, he's probably a CIA guy that's a fan of the Washington Commanders and was like, what the hell? Yeah, yeah. He's like, <laughs> why do why do we pick up old what's-his-nuts? Yeah. 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 He probably was it, just it, pissed. Yeah, how can we have our manlyhood back? Thanks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. How come we can never never put together a decent team? <laughs> why, were, why were we not called the Red Wolves? Yeah. I don't know. Okay, well, lock our meter tomorrow. And uh, again, folks, we want to thank you so much for uh, for joining us here on the program, for for listening to us on a daily basis when we release a program, uh, for being uh, great listeners, for joining us. You know, we have more and more people uh, joining us here on the program and, and building the program. We want to appreciate you for for uh, getting on board on the program, uh, and we also uh, would like to. You know what? I, we're going to have a special thank you drawing for a special gift. We told okay. you we were going to do some NFTs down yeah. the down the road. They're not, but they're not non fungible. Um, they're going to be physical. They're going to be NPTs. Uh, they're going to okay. be a one of a kind gifts that uh, that will make up just for one person in the audience. 
um, that will be special Darkness Radio logo gifts. Um, so we'll have drawings for those in the future. Um, and we're, we're coming up with a special line of Darkness Radio uh, swag that uh, you and you alone will have. It's a one-of-a-kind item from Darkness Radio, just kind of a thank you. Uh, so we'll be making those up, and we'll be giving those away here shortly during the holiday season here. So um, we'll be drawing for those. It's just kind of a thank you for jumping on board and supporting the, the, the newest version, iteration of the show here. It's just a way of Bruiser and I saying thank you, and we love you, and we appreciate you. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we'll be doing that here on the air. Uh, that's about it. I think that's all we have for today. Uh, for Beer City Bruiser, I'm Tim Dennis. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we will see you tomorrow for the big show right here on the best in paranormal podcasting. This is Darkness Radio.